Chapter 1 of The Notary's Nose. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Notary's Nose by Edmund Abou, translated by Henry Holt. Chapter 1 The East and West at War. Blood Flows. Master Alfred Lambert, before the fatal blow which obliged him to change his nose, was certainly the most brilliant notary in France. At that time he was thirty-two years old. His figure was noble, his eyes large and well set, he had the front of Jove himself, and beard and hair of the blonde tint most approved. His nose, the noblest feature that ever bore the name, had the sweep of the eagle's beak. Yet notwithstanding perfection so eminently masculine, a white cravat became him admirably. Was it because he had worn one from his tenderest years, or because he knew the right shop? I suppose it was for both reasons together. It is one thing to envelop one's neck in a pocket-handkerchief twisted into a rope, but it is a vastly different thing to concentrate the resources of art upon a perfect white cambric tie with ends of equal length, starched in moderation and symmetrically pointing to the right and left. A white cravat, well selected and well tied, is by no means a graceless decoration. All the ladies will tell you so. But the mere getting it on right is not the whole thing. You must wear it right, too, and that is a matter of experience. Why does a clodhopper appear so awkward and utterly lost on his wedding day? Simply because he has got himself tied up in a white cravat without preparing himself with preliminary study. Now a man can get used in no time to the most extraordinary headgear. A crown, for example— there was that soldier Bonaparte who picked one up, which a king of France had let drop in the Place Louis XV, and got himself up in it without taking lessons of anybody. Yet Europe declared that it was by no means unbecoming. He even, after a while, made crowns quite the fashion among his family and intimate friends. Everybody around him either wore one or wanted to. Yet that extraordinary man was but an indifferent hand at weaving a white tie. There was Monsieur le Vicomte de C Blanc, author of several prose poems, who had studied diplomacy or the art of tying one's cravat to some purpose. He was present at the review of our last army a few days before the Waterloo campaign. What do you suppose stirred his soul at that heroic fit? where blazed forth the desperate enthusiasm of great people. The fact that Bonaparte's tie did not set well. Few men could contest the supremacy of this peaceful field with Master Alfred Lambert. I call him Lambert, not Lambert. There is a decision of the Conseil d'État on that question. Master Lambert, succeeding his father, practiced his profession of notary as a birthright. For two centuries and more that glorious family had transmitted from father to son the office in Rue Vermeille, and the very highest clientage in the Faubourg Saint-Germain. There was no way of telling what the practice was worth, as it had never been out of the family. But judging from the income of the five years preceding, it could not be called less than 400,000 francs. That is to say, it netted year in and year out, about twenty thousand dollars. For two centuries and more, the eldest sons had worn the white cravat of their office as naturally as crows wear black feathers, drunkards red noses, or poets seedy clothes. Legitimate heir of a name and fortune of no mean pretensions, little Alfred had sucked in sound principles with his milk. He duly detested all the novelties which had been introduced into French politics after the catastrophe of 1789. In his eyes, the French nation was made up of three classes, the clergy, the nobility, and the commonalty, a very respectable opinion, and held even now by a few senators. He modestly counted himself among the foremost of the commonalty, not, however, without some secret pretensions to the nobility conferred by the judicial robe. 
he held in loftiest scorn the bulk of the French nation, that collection of peasants and mechanics which is called the people or the common herd. He came in contact with them as little as possible out of regard to his admirable person, which he loved and took care of with passionate fervor. Life, healthy and vigorous as a pickerel, he was satisfied that those people were a sort of small fry created by providence expressly that they might nourish their high mightinesses, the pickerel. A charming fellow, nevertheless, like nearly all egoists, popular with the lawyers, at his club, among the notaries, at church, and at the fencing school, a good fencer, a good drinker, a generous lover so far as his heart was touched, a faithful friend to men in his own sphere, a most accommodating creditor so far as he loaned out his income, refined in his tastes, exquisite in his dress, fresh as a new coin, assiduous on Sunday at the ceremonies in the church of saint Thomas d'Aquin, and on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at those in the green room of the opera. He would have been the most perfect gentleman of his time in appearance and character if he only had been free from a deplorable near-sightedness which condemned him to wear glasses. Is it necessary to add that his glasses were in gold frames, the finest, lightest, and most elegant that were ever made at the establishment of the celebrated Mathieu Luna, Quai des Orfèves? He did not wear them always, but only at his office, or at a client's, when he had documents to read. You may well believe that on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, when he entered the ballet green room, he took particular care to unmask his fine eyes. No biconcave glass then veiled the brilliancy of his glance. He did not see anything, I am perfectly satisfied, and sometimes bowed to a mere walking lady, taking her for a star. But he had the resolute air of an Alexander entering Babylon. Moreover, the little girls of the corps de ballet, who usually nicknamed people, had dubbed him Conqueror. An amiable fat Turk, secretary to the embassy, had received the name Tranquillity. A member of the Council of State was called Melancholy. The head secretary of the blank office, a man of quick and awkward gait, was called Monsieur Turlu. That is why little Elise Champagne, also known as Champagne II, received the name of Turlurette when she left the Corifée to raise herself to the rank of sujet. My country readers, if this voracious history should ever happen to pass beyond the fortifications of Paris, will deliberate a minute or two over the preceding paragraph. Even from here... I can hear a thousand and one questions which they mentally address to the author. What is the ballet green room, and the corps de ballet, and the opera stars, and the corifé, and the sujet, and walking ladies, and government secretaries who stray into such a world at the risk of fastening nicknames to themselves? And finally, how happens it that a man of established position and regular habits, a man of principle like Master Alfred Lambert, should be there three times a week in the ballet green room? Ah, dear friends, it is precisely because he was a man of established principle and regular habits, a man of principle. The ballet green room was then a large square room furnished with old red velvet sofas and frequented by all the leading men of Paris. There you could meet not only with financiers, cabinet ministers and their secretaries, but even dukes, princes, deputies, prefects, and senators most devoted to the temporal power of the Pope. There was even no lack of prelates. There you could see married ministers, and even the most completely married of all our ministers. When I say you could see them there, it is not because I've seen them myself. You will understand very well that poor devils of journalists could not get in there as if it were a mill. 
A cabinet minister holds the keys of that garden of the Hesperides in his own hands. No one can get in without his excellency's permission. You should bear in mind, too, the rivalries, jealousies, and intrigues. How many cabinets have been overthrown on the most diverse pretexts, but at bottom, because all the statesmen wanted to reign supreme in the ballet green room? Don't think for a moment that such personages were drawn there by appetite for interdicted pleasures. They were burning with desire to encourage one of the most aristocratic and politic of the arts. The course of years has possibly changed all this. For Master Lambert's adventures were not of this week. Nevertheless, they do not date back to the most hidden antiquity, but reasons of eminent propriety prevent me from naming the exact year when that officer of the civil service exchanged his aquiline nose for a straight one. That is the reason why I vaguely said, at that time, as storytellers do. Suffice it to say that these events took place somewhere in the world's history, between the burning of Troy by the Greeks and the burning of the Summer Palace at Pekin by the English army, two memorable halting places in European civilization. A contemporary and client of Master Lambert, the Marquis d'Ombremule, said one evening at the Café Anglais, What distinguishes us from common men is our liking for the ballet. The common herd goes crazy over music, claps its hands over Rossini's operas and Donizetti's and Albert's. It would seem as if a million little notes mixed up like a salad have something about them to tickle the ears of such people. They carry the thing to the ridiculous extent of sometimes singing themselves, with their great rasping voices, and the police permit them to assemble in certain public halls to murder some of the minor heirs. Much good may it do them. As for me, I don't listen to an opera at all. I watch it. I go in time for the ballet, and after it I clear out. My worthy grandmother has told me that all the court ladies of her time went to the opera for nothing but the ballet. They didn't refuse any encouragement to the dancing gentlemen. Now our time has come. It is our function to take care of the dancing ladies. On y soit qui mal y pense. There was the little Duchess de Bietry. Young, pretty, and neglected, she was weak enough to find fault with the ways of conducting himself at the opera, which her husband had fallen into. "'Aren't you ashamed of yourself?' she said to him. "'To leave me alone in your box with all your friends while you run off the Lord knows where?' "'Madam,' he answered, "'where one is trying to get an embassy, oughtn't he to study politics?' "'Perhaps, but there are better schools in Paris, I fancy.' "'Not at all.' Let me tell you, my dear child, that the ballet and politics are twins. To endeavor to please by courting the public, to keep your eyes on the leader of the orchestra, to control your face, to change the color of your dress every moment, to hop from right to left and from left to right, to spin round lightly, to always land on your feet, to smile with your eyes full of tears. Isn't that, in a few words, the program of the ballet and of politics? The Duchess smiled, forgave him, and took a lover. Great lords like the Duc de Bietry, statesmen like Baron de F, great millionaires like little Monsieur Saint, and mere notaries like the hero of this story, elbowed each other pell-mell in the ballet green room and side scenes of the stage. They were all equal before the ignorance and naivete of those twenty-four little innocents who composed the ballet. They are called the subscribers. They are smiled upon freely. They are prattled with in little corners. Their bonbons and even their diamonds are accepted as a mere matter of politeness, not committing their receivers to anything. The world is entirely wrong in fancying that the opera is a market for easy pleasure and a school for libertinage. More virtue can be found there than in any other theatre in Paris. And why? because virtue brings a better price there than anywhere else. Is it not interesting to make a close study of this little populace of young girls, almost all springing from very low origin, and able in no time to rise so high by talent or beauty? 
fed upon dry bread and green apples in some workman's garret or porter's lodge, they come to the theatre in gingham and old shoes and slip off furtively to dress themselves. Half an hour afterward, they come down to the green room, radiant, sparkling, covered with silk and gauze and flowers, all at the expense of the state, and more brilliant than the fairies, angels, the houris of our dreams. Ministers and princes kiss their hands and whiten their own dress coats with the powder off the girls' arms. They babble into their ears all sorts of madrigals old and new, which sometimes are understood. Some of these girls have mother wit and talk well. These are soon carried away. A tap of the bell calls the fairies to the stage. The crowd of subscribers follows them even to the beginning of the act, holds them back and engrosses them behind the side scenes. Brave subscriber who risks the fall of the scenery, the spots of lamp oil, the greatest variety of stenches for the pleasure of hearing a little voice, slightly hoarse, murmur these charming words. Jiminy, don't my feet hurt! The curtain rises, and the twenty-four queens of an hour joyously frisk under the lorgnettes of an enraptured public. There is not one of them who does not see or think she sees among the audience. Two, three, ten adorers, known or unknown. What a fit for the girls till the curtain falls. They are pretty, decked up, gazed after, admired, and have nothing to fear from criticisms or hisses. Midnight sounds. Everything is changed as in the fairy tale. Cinderella starts with her mother or with her big sister toward the cheap garrets of Batignol or Montmartre. She limps a trifle, poor little one, and spatters her grey stockings. The good and wise mother of the family, who has placed all her hopes on the head of this child, repeats over again on the way a few lessons in wisdom. Keep the straight path in life, my daughter, and don't allow yourself to fall. Or if the fates absolutely decide that such misfortune shall reach you, be very careful to fall upon a rosewood bed. The counsels of experience are not always followed. Sometimes the heart speaks. Sometimes the dancing girls are known to marry the dancing men. Sometimes little girls as pretty as Venus and the Diomene have been known to save a hundred thousand francs worth of jewellery that they might lead to the altar a clerk on two thousand a year. Others leave the care of their future to chance, and are the despair of their families. One concludes to wait until the tenth of April before disposing of her heart, because she has sworn to herself that she would keep steady until she should be seventeen. Another finds a protector to her taste, but does not dare to say so. She dreads the vengeance of a treasury auditor who has vowed to kill her and himself if she should love anybody else. He is joking, as you understand very well. But in this little world they take people's words in earnest. How naive they are, and ignorant of everything! Why, even two great girls, sixteen years old, have been heard disputing over the nobility of their origin and the rank of their families. "'Just look at that girl,' said the larger. "'Her mother's earrings are silver, and my father's are gold.' Master Alfred Lambert, after long deliberating between brunette and blonde, had ended up by becoming enamoured of a pretty brunette with blue eyes. Mademoiselle Victorine Dompin was a knowing creature, as they generally are at the opera, even on matters where they ought not to be, well brought up, too, and incapable of making any important decision without consulting her parents. For about six months she had been pressed pretty closely by the handsome notary, and by Ivaz Bey, that fat Turk, twenty-five years old, who was known by the nickname of Tranquility. Both had had some serious talks with her in regard to her future respectable Madame Dampin held her daughter in a judicious middle course, waiting until one of the two rivals should decide to talk business with her. The Turk was a good fellow, honest, staid, and timid. He spoke up, nevertheless, and was listened to. Everybody learned this little secret in good time, except Master Lambert, who was off burying an uncle in Poitiers, 
When he got back to the opera, Mademoiselle Victorine Tompin had a diamond bracelet, diamond earrings, and a diamond heart like a chandelier hanging from her neck. The notary was near-sighted. I think I told you so at the outset. He did not see anything that he ought to have seen. Least of all, the wicked smiles which greeted his return. He floated about, chatted, and shone, as usual, impatiently waiting for the end of the ballet and the appearance of the girls. His arrangements were made. The future of Mademoiselle Victorine was fixed, thanks to that excellent uncle in Poitiers, who had died just in the nick of time. The place in Paris that they call the Passage de l'Opéra is crowded with galleries, wide or narrow, light or dark, of various heights, which run along the boulevard, the Rue Le Pelletier, the Rue du Haut, and the Rue Rossini. A long gallery, open most of the way, reaches from the Rue du Haut to the Rue Le Pelletier, running across from the Galerie du Barometre and the Galerie d'Horloge. At the lower end of it are a couple of steps from the Rue du Rau is the stage door of the theatre, the entrance used at night by the artists. Every midnight a crowd of three or four hundred people rolls tumultuously under the eyes of Papa Monge, the concierge of that paradise, machinists, supers, walking ladies, choristers, dancing girls and dancing men, tenors, sopranos, authors, musical composers, business managers, subscribers, all rushed out pell-mell. Some go down toward the Rue du Rouau. Others go up the staircase which leads through an open gallery to the Rue Le Pelletier. About the middle of this open passage, near the Galerie du Barometre, Alfred Lambert was smoking a cigar and waiting. Ten paces farther on, a little fat man, in his scarlet fez, smoked with steady puffs a Turkish cigarette bigger than your little finger. Twenty other loungers, who had some business or other there, moved about or looked around them, each one intent on his own business, without paying any attention to his neighbor. The singers passed along humming, and the male sylphs, getting along as easily as they could in old shoes, passed by, limping and every minute or two a female shadow, shrouded in black, grey, or purple, slid along between the infrequent gaslights, unrecognizable to all eyes except the eyes of love. Two would meet, join each other, and start off, without saying any goodbyes to the company. But stop! Suddenly there arises a strange noise, an unusual tumult. Two of these shadowy forms have passed. Two men have run together. Two lighted cigars have approached each other. People have heard noisy voices, as if there was some hasty quarrel. Promenaders have crowded together at one point, but they have not found anybody. Master Alfred Lambert goes down all alone toward his carriage, which was waiting for him on the boulevard. He shrugs his shoulders and mechanically examines this card, spotted by a large drop of blood. Ivas B., secrétaire de l'ambassade ottomane, rue de Grenelle, Saint-Germain, Son. Listen to what he says between his teeth, this handsome notary of the rue de Verneuil. A foolish affair. Devil take me if I knew that she had given any control over herself to that beast of a Turk, for it was certainly he. Why didn't I have my spectacles on? It looks as if I had struck him on the nose with my fist. Yes, his card is spotted, and so are my gloves. Here I am with a Turk on my hands, and all through my awkwardness, for I didn't have any ill will toward the fellow. And the girl is of no consequence to me, after all. He's got her, and I hope he'll take care of her. Two sensible fellows are not going to cut each other's throats from Mademoiselle Victorine Tompin. But that confounded blow, that spoils everything. That is what he said between his teeth, his thirty-two teeth, whiter and sharper than those of a young wolf. He sent his coachman back home and started off slowly on foot toward the Cirque des Chemins de Fer. There he found two friends and told them what had happened. The old Marquis de Villemorin, an ex-captain of the Royal Guard, and young Henri Steinbourg, a stockbroker, 
both agreed that the blow spoiled everything. End of chapter one. Chapter two of The Notary's Nose. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Notary's Nose by Edmund Abou, translated by Henry Holt. The Cat Chase A Turkish philosopher has said, There are no agreeable blows administered by the fist, but blows on the nose are the most disagreeable of all. The same thinker justly adds, in the chapter immediately following, to strike a man before the woman he loves is to strike him twice. You wound the body and the soul. That is why Ivaz Bey, who was a patient man, grew red with anger while he took Mademoiselle Tompin and her mother to the apartment which he had furnished for them. He bade them good-bye at the door, jumped into a carriage, and drove, bleeding all the while, to his colleague and friend Ahmed. Ahmed slept under the guardianship of a faithful Afrit. Although it is written, Thou shalt not wake thy sleeping friend, it is also written, Wake him, nevertheless, if danger impends over him or thee. The good Ahmed was wakened. He was a tall Turk, about thirty-five years old, thin and lank, with long bow-legs, an excellent fellow withal, and a man of sense. There is something good among these people, whatever you may say. As soon as he saw the bloody face of his friend, he forthwith brought him a great basin of fresh water, for it is written, Take no thought before washing off thy blood, thy thoughts would be troubled and impure. Ivas was washed off a good deal sooner than he was calmed. He told his story in a rage. The Afrit, who found himself in the position of a third party to the conversation, offered to take his scimitar and go and kill Monsieur Lambert. Ahmed Bey thanked him for his good disposition and kicked him out of the room. And now, said he to the good Ivaz, what shall we do? That's simple enough, replied the other. I'll cut his nose off tomorrow morning. The lex talionis is written in the Koran, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a nose for a nose. Ahmed remonstrated that though the Koran was certainly a good book, it had grown a little out of date. Maxims on points of honour had changed some since Mahomet. Moreover, on the ground that the law should be applied to the very letter, Ivaz would have to strike Monsieur Lambert on the nose with his fist. What right have you got to cut off his nose, since he's not cut off yours? But does a young man who has had his nose mashed in the presence of his mistress ever listen to reason? Ivaz wanted blood, and Ahmed had to promise it. It's all very well, said he. We represent our country in a strange land. We ought not to receive an affront without proving our courage. But how can you fight a duel with Monsieur Lambert according to the rules of this country? You know nothing of the small sword. What have I got to do with the small sword? I want to cut his nose off, I tell you, and a small sword wouldn't be of any use in what I'm after. If you were only anything of a hand with a pistol. Are you crazy? What do I want with a pistol? To cut the nose off an impudent puppy? Aye. Yes, the thing is fixed. Go and find him and arrange everything for tomorrow, and we will fight with sabres. But, my dear fellow, what will you do with a sabre? I don't doubt your courage, but I must say without meaning to offend you that you're not quite as skilful as Ponce. What difference does that make? Get up and go tell him to hold his nose subject to my orders tomorrow morning. Ahmed was a sensible fellow, and understood that logic would be entirely out of place, and that he was reasoning against the wind. What would be the use in preaching to a deaf man who held on to his idea like the Pope to the temporal power? So he dressed himself, took along his first dragoman, Osman Bey, who had just gotten in from the Imperial Club, and drove to Master Lambert's. The time was perfectly unseasonable, but Ivaz would not stand the loss of a single moment. No more would the god of battles, at least everything leads me to think so. At the very moment when the first secretary was about to ring Master Lambert's bell, he met the enemy in person, who was returning on foot, talking with his two friends. Monsieur Lambert saw the red fezes, took in the situation, bowed, and opened the conversation with a certain dignity which was by no means devoid of grace. Gentlemen, said he to the new arrivals, as I am the only occupant of this house, I presume I am correct in supposing that the honour of this visit is intended for me. I am Monsieur Lambert. Permit me to show you in. He rung, pushed the door open, 
went across the court with his four nocturnal visitors and conducted them into his office. There the two Turks gave him their names. The notary presented his two friends to them and left the parties face to face. A duel cannot take place in France without the desire or at least the consent of six persons. Now there were five who did not desire this one at all. Master Lambert was a brave man, but he could not deny to himself that a disturbance of this kind on account of a little danseuse at the opera would seriously injure his practice. The Marquis de Villemorin, an old gentleman cultivated up to the highest point in affairs of honour, declared that the duel was a noble game, where everything from the beginning of the match to the end ought to be in strict order. Now a blow on the nose from Mademoiselle Victorine Tompin was the most ridiculous opening of the game that could be imagined. He declared, moreover, upon his honour that Monsieur Alfred Lambert had not seen Ivas Bay, and that he did not want to strike him or anybody else. Monsieur Lambert had thought he recognised two ladies and had hastily stepped up to speak to them. In carrying his hand to his hat, he had violently and unintentionally struck a person who was running up from an opposite direction. It was a pure accident, an awkwardness at the most. People are not supposed to be called upon to account for accidents or even awkwardness. The rank and education of Monsieur Lambert would not let anybody suppose that he was capable of striking Ivas Bay with his fist. His notorious near-sightedness and the darkness of the passage had done the damage. Finally, Monsieur Lambert, with the advice of his friends, was entirely ready to say in the presence of Ivas Bay that he regretted having accidentally hurt him. This way of putting it sounded well enough in itself and received a sort of additional authority from the character of the speaker. Monsieur de Villemorin was one of those gentlemen who seem to have been forgotten by death for the sake of recalling historic times to our degenerate age. The record of his birth did not allow him more than seventy-nine years, but in his habits and sympathies he belonged to the sixteenth century. He thought, spoke, and acted as a man who had served in the army of the League and put the Béarnais to flight. A royalist from conviction, an austere Catholic, he brought to his hates and to his friendships a warmth which exaggerated everything. His courage, his loyalty, his rectitude, and even, to a certain degree, his eccentric chivalrousness, made him a model for the admiration of the inconsistent youth of today. He never laughed, was slow to take a joke, and felt injured by a bon mot, as if it indicated a lack of respect. He was the least tolerant, the least lovable, and the most honourable old gentleman in the world. He had accompanied Charles X to Scotland after the fatal days of July, but he left Holyrood after being there about a fortnight, scandalised to see that the court of France did not take misfortune in earnest. He forthwith sent in his resignation and cut off his moustache for ever. This he preserved in a sort of casket with this inscription, Mes moustaches de la garde royale. His subordinates, officers, and soldiers held him in great esteem and in great terror. It was whispered that this inflexible man had imprisoned his only son, a young soldier of twenty-two, for an act of insubordination. The boy, worthy son of such a father, obstinately refused to yield, fell sick in prison, and died. Our Brutus bewailed his son, built a suitable tomb for him, and visited it regularly twice a week, without forgetting his duty in any weather or at any time. But he did not bend under the burden of his remorse. He walked, erect, with a certain rigidity. Neither age nor grief had rounded his broad shoulders. He was a stubby little man, vigorous and still addicted to the exercises of his youth. He relied more on playing tennis than on medicine for preserving his vigorous health. At sixty he had married a second time, his wife being a young girl, noble and poor. He had two children by her and did not despair of soon becoming a grandfather. The love of life, so powerful in men of his age, had very moderate hold on him, although he was happy enough here below. He had had his last duel when he was sixty-two with a handsome six-foot colonel, some say on account of politics, others say conjugal jealousy. When a man of such rank and character undertook to act and speak in behalf of Monsieur Lambert when he declared that a duel between the notary and Evas Bay would be useless, compromising, and vulgar, peace seemed signed in advance. Such was the opinion of Monsieur Henri Steinbourg, who was neither young enough nor curious enough to want to see a duel at any price, and the two Turks, like sensible men, at once accepted the reparation which was offered. They nevertheless asked to confer with Ivas, and while they ran to the embassy, the enemy awaited them on the spot. It was four o'clock in the morning, but not even a clear conscience would give the Marquis sleep. 
as long as anything was left to be settled he could not go to bed but the terrible ivas at the first words which his friends uttered regarding a reconciliation got into a regular turkish rage am i a fool he cried brandishing the jessamine chibouk which had kept him company are you trying to persuade me that i gave myself the blow against monsieur lambert's fist he struck me and the proof is that he offers to apologize but what's the use of words when blood is spilt can i forget that victorine and her mother were witnesses to my shame oh my friends there is nothing left for me to do but die if i cannot cut the rascal's nose off to-day nolens volens their negotiations had to be renewed on this somewhat ridiculous basis ahmed and the dragoman had minds reasonable enough to blame their friend but hearts too generous to leave him in the lurch if the ambassador hamsa pasha had happened to be in paris he would have undoubtedly stopped the affair by some stroke of authority but unfortunately he held the two embassies of france and england and was in london the good Ivar's friends flew like shuttles between the rue de grenelle and the rue de verneuil until seven o'clock in the morning without getting things on perceptibly at seven o'clock m lambert lost patience and said to his seconds this turk bores me he's not satisfied with getting little tompin away from me but the gentleman finds it to his pleasure to make me pass a sleepless night very well let us go ahead he may end by thinking that i'm afraid to meet him but now push things through if you please try and finish up the matter this morning i will have my horses hitched in ten minutes we will go a couple of leagues outside paris i will bring my turk to his senses in a jiffy and get back to the office before the little newspapers that delight in scandal can get wind of our affair the marquis still tried one or two objections but he ended by owning that m lambert was forced into it eva's bay's stubbornness was in the worst kind of taste and deserved a severe lesson nobody could doubt that the bellicose notary so favourably known in the fencing schools was the professor chosen by destiny to indoctrinate french politeness into this child of islam my dear boy said old villemorin clapping his man on the shoulder our position is excellent for we have right on our side leave the rest to god the result is not at all doubtful you have a firm heart and a quick hand always remember though that one ought not to lunge deeply for the duel is made to correct fools not to destroy them nobody but a gawky would kill his man on the pretext of teaching him how to live the choice of arms fell by lot to our amiable evas but the notary and his seconds winced a little upon learning that he selected sabres that is the weapon of soldiers said the marquis or of vulgar fellows who don't want to fight nevertheless the sabre let it be if you stick to it evas bey's second said that they were very decided about it then they went to seek a couple of broadswords or short swords at the shop on the quai d'orsay and they agreed to meet at ten o'clock at the little village of patanay on the old road to Sceaux. when they separated it was half-past eight everybody in paris knows that pretty collection of about two hundred houses whose inhabitants are richer better behaved and better educated than most of our villagers they till the soil as gardeners and not as labourers and through the whole spring their lands are a paradise on earth a field of strawberry blossoms spreads out like cloth of silver between a field of currants and one of raspberries whole acres exhale the perfume of the black currant delightful to the nose of the concierge paris buys the harvest of patanay with beautiful louis d'or and the sturdy peasants whom you see trudging along slowly a watering pot in each hand are little capitalists they eat meat twice a day scorn boiled hen and prefer roasted capon they pay the salaries of a schoolmaster and a doctor employed for the general good they have built a house for the mayor and a church without running into debt and vote for my ingenious friend dr veron in the elections for the corps législatif their girls are pretty if my memory serves me rightly the learned archaeologist cubaudet recorder of the sub-prefecture of sceaux declares that Partenay is a greek colony and that it gets its name from the word parthenos a virgin or young girl it is all one among people of high civilization but this discussion would lead us away from our good evas he reached the rendezvous first still raging how proudly he paced the village square while waiting for the enemy under his mantle he had two formidable yatta guns excellent damascus blades what did i say damascus two japanese blades those that cut a bar of iron as readily as a sprout of asparagus if they are swung by a good arm 
Ahmed Bey and the faithful dragoman followed their friend and gave him the wisest counsels to attack cautiously, to expose himself the least possible, to leap back instantly when disposed to take a second's breathing space, in a word, everything that could be said to a novice going into the field without knowing what he's got to do. "'Thanks for your hints,' answered the obstinate fellow. "'There's no need of so much ceremony in cutting the nose off a notary.' The object of his vengeance soon appeared between two spectacle glasses at the window of the notary's carriage. But Monsieur Lambert did not alight. He contented himself with bowing. The Marquis got out and went to speak to the tall Ahmed Bey. "'I know an excellent spot, about twenty minutes from here. Be so good as to get into your carriage again with your friends and follow me.' The belligerents took a crossroad and got out about half a mile from the houses. "'Gentlemen,' said the Marquis, we can reach the little wood you see yonder on foot. The coachman will wait for us here. We have forgotten to bring a surgeon, but the footman whom I left at Patane will bring the village doctor. The Turk's coachman was one of those Parisian marauders who go about after midnight under counterfeit numbers. Ivaz had picked him up at Mademoiselle Tompin's door, and had held on to him even to Patane. The old bummer smiled slightly when he found that they'd stopped him in the open country and that they had sabres under their cloaks. "'Good luck to you, boss,' said he to our brave Evas. "'Oh, you don't run any risk. I always brings luck to the gents I carries. Why, only last year I brought one out who dropped his man. He gave me twenty-five francs drink money. It's true, just as I tell you.' "'You shall have fifty, said Evas, if God grants me the vengeance I seek.' M. Lambert was an admirable fencer, and too well known in the schools to have ever had occasion to fight, so in an actual duel he was as inexperienced as Evas Bey. Therefore, although he had beaten his drill-masters and marshals of several cavalry regiments in fencing, he felt a sort of dull trepidation which had no fear about it, but which nevertheless produced just the same effects. In the carriage his conversation had been brilliant. With his seconds he had displayed a gaiety, perfectly spontaneous, but nevertheless a little feverish. He had burned three or four cigars on the way under pretense of smoking them. When they all got out, he walked with a firm step, a little too firm, perhaps. At the bottom of his soul he was the victim of some apprehension, but it was entirely manly and entirely French. He distrusted his nervous system and feared that he would not appear as brave as he was. It would seem as if the powers of the soul are doubled in the critical moments of life, and so although M. Lambert was certainly interested in the little drama in which he was to play a part, the most insignificant objects of the outer world, those which ordinarily would have attracted his attention the least, now riveted it with irresistible power. To his eyes, nature was illumined with a new light, clearer, more penetrating, fuller than the usual light of the sun. His preoccupation emphasized, so to say, everything that fell under his eyes. At a turn of the path he noticed a cat, moving stealthily between two rows of currant bushes. It was such a cat as one sees a great many of in villages, a long, thin cat, with a whitish skin spotted in dusty brown, one of those half-savage animals whose masters feed them liberally with all the mice that they are smart enough to catch. This one had undoubtedly found that the house where it lived did not sufficiently abound in game, and was endeavouring to eke out his pittance in the open field. M. Lambert's eyes, after casually wandering toward him several times, felt attracted, and as it were fascinated, by the aspect of that cat. He watched him attentively, admired the suppleness of his muscles, the vigorous outline of his jaws, and thought he had made a discovery in natural history when he observed that the cat is a miniature tiger. "'What the deuce are you looking at there?' asked the Marquis, clapping him on the shoulder. He came to himself at once and answered in the easiest manner. That dirty beast was attracting my attention. You would hardly believe, Monsieur le Marquis, the bother that those rascals give us in hunting. They eat more coveys of partridges than we shoot. If I had a gun, and joining the action to the word, he took aim at the animal with his finger. The cat, seemed to understand the motion, jumped back and disappeared. He appeared again a couple of hundred paces farther off, and dressed his whiskers in the midst of a cabbage patch while seeming to wait for the Parisians. "'Are you following us?' called out the notary, repeating his threatening gesture. The overprudent beast took to flight again, but reappeared at the edge of the clearing where they were going to fight. M. Lambert, superstitious as a gambler about to make a heavy bet, wanted to chase away this malevolent fetish. He threw a pebble at him without hitting him, and the cat climbed a tree and kept still. The seconds had already selected a spot, and drawn lots for places. 
the better fell to Monsieur Lambert, and the lot also decreed that they should use the weapons he had brought, and not the Japanese Yatagans, which would have been awkward for him. Nothing appeared awkward for Avas. To him every sabre was a good sabre. He watched his enemy's nose as a fisherman watches a handsome trout dangling at the end of his line. He rapidly pulled off all clothes which were not absolutely indispensable, threw his red fez and green coat on the grass, and rolled his shirt-sleeves up to the elbow. It must be admitted that the sleepiest Turks wake up at the clash of arms. This big boy, whose face showed him every inch a Turk, appeared transfigured. His face seemed to glow. His eyes shot flames. He took a sabre from the Marquis's hand, stepped back two paces, and intoned in Turkish a poetical improvisation which his friend, Osman Bey, has had the kindness to preserve and translate for us. I am armed for the combat. Woe to the Gaiar who insults me. The price of blood is blood. Thou hast smitten me with the hand. I, Evaz, son of Rukhti, will smite thee with the sword. Thy mutilated face shall make lovely women laugh. Schlosser and Mercier, Tibar and Saville shall turn from thee in scorn. The perfume of the roses of Ismar shall be lost to thee. May Mahomet give me strength. I ask courage from no one. Hurrah! I am armed for the combat. He spoke and threw himself upon his adversary. He attacked him en thiers or en carte. I don't know which. Neither does he, nor the seconds, nor Monsieur Lambert. But a jet of blood spurted at the end of his sabre. A pair of spectacles glistened on the ground, and the notary felt his head lighter in front by the whole weight of his nose. A little of it was left, but so little that I only mentioned it for the sake of accuracy. Monsieur Lambert recoiled backwards, but soon recovered himself and ran about with his head hanging down like a blind man or a crazy one. At the same moment a dark body fell from the branch of an oak. A minute later they noticed the approach of a little thin man, hat in hand, followed by a tall servant in livery. This was Monsieur Triquet, health officer of the parish of Patenay. All hail to thee, worthy Monsieur Triquet. A brilliant Paris notary is in great need of thy services. Put thy old hat on thy bald head, rub off the drops of sweat glistening on thy red cheeks like dew on a full-blown peony, and roll back as soon as thou canst the glossy sleeves of thy respectable black coat. But the worthy man was too much excited to set to work at once. He talked, talked, talked with a thin, piping little voice. Bless my soul, said he, my respects to you, I am your very humble servant. Does Jesus permit people to get themselves in such a condition? It is a mutilation, I see what it is. "'Decidedly it is too late to bring conciliatory words. "'Here the harm is done. "'Ah, gentlemen, gentlemen, youth will always be young. "'As for me, I don't permit myself to be led "'into destroying or mutilating my kind. "'It was in 1820. "'What did I do, gentlemen? "'I made apologies, yes, apologies, "'and I honour myself for it, "'especially as right was on my side. "'You have never read Rousseau's beautiful pages "'against duelling. "'It is absolutely irrefutable. "'It is a literary and moral Christomathy. "'And even Rousseau has not said all that could be said. "'If he had studied the human body, "'that masterpiece of creation, "'that admirable image of God on earth, "'he would have demonstrated to you "'that it is most culpable to destroy "'so perfect a combination. "'I don't say this against the person "'who gave the blow. "'God forbid! "'He undoubtedly had his reasons, which I respect. "'But if he had only known "'how much trouble it gives us poor doctors "'to cure the slightest wound, "'it is true we live by them and by sickness. "'But what difference does that make? "'I would rather deprive myself of everything "'and live on a piece of sour lard "'spread over brown bread "'than to witness the sufferings of my fellow creatures.' The Marquis interrupted this bewailing. Very well, doctor, we're not here to philosophize. Here's a man bleeding like an ox, and the thing to do is to stop the hemorrhage. Yes, sir, he answered quickly. The hemorrhage, that is the proper word. Fortunately, I have provided for everything. Here is a file of styptic fluid. It is Brocchieri's preparation. I prefer it to Lechelle's prescription. He started, file in hand, towards Monsieur Lambert, who was seated at the foot of a tree, bleeding piteously. Monsieur, he said, with a profound obeisance, I beg you to believe that I sincerely regret not having had the honour of making your acquaintance under circumstances less deplorable. 
Monsieur Lambert raised his head and said in a doleful voice, Doctor, shall I lose my nose? No, monsieur, you will not lose it. Alas, you no longer have it to lose, my dear sir. You have lost it already. While speaking, he turned to the brocchieri water on a compress. Heavens, cried he, monsieur, I have an idea. I can restore you that useful and agreeable organ which you have lost. What do you say? The devil! My fortune is yours. Ah, doctor, rather than live disfigured, I would die. Yes, so people talk. But let us see. Where is the piece they cut off? I am not a champion of the ability of Monsieur Velpeau or of Monsieur Huguier, but I would undertake to patch up things as they were originally. Monsieur Lambert got up precipitately and ran to the field of battle. The Marquis and Monsieur Steinbock followed him. The Turks, who were walking together moodily enough, for Ivas' fire had been quenched in a second, joined their late enemies. They easily found the place where the combatants had trodden down the new grass. They found the old spectacles, but the notary's nose was no longer there. But they saw a cat, a horrible white and yellow cat, who was licking his bloody chops with gusto. Great heavens! cried the Marquis, pointing to the beast. Everybody understood the gesture and exclamation. "'Can there be time yet?' asked the notary. "'Possibly,' said the doctor. Then they ran. But the cat was not in the humour of being caught, and he ran, too. Never had the little wood of Partenay seen, and certainly never will it see again such a chase— a marquis, a broker, three diplomats, a village doctor, a footman in gorgeous livery, and a notary, bleeding in his handkerchief, launched desperately in pursuit of an emaciated cat, running, shouting, throwing stones, dead branches, everything which came to hand. They went over roads and clearings, dashing with their heads down into the closest thickets, sometimes together, sometimes scattered, sometimes drawn out in echelon sometimes ranged in a semicircle round the enemy, beating the bushes, shaking the shrubbery, climbing trees, tearing their gaiters against stumps, and their clothes against bushes, they rushed on like a tempest. But the infernal cat was swifter than the wind. Twice they thought they could surround him, twice he forced the circle and took to the field. One moment he seemed to be conquered by fatigue or despair. He had fallen on his side, trying to jump from one tree to another, as squirrels do— Monsieur Lambert's valet ran for him from the farther end of the crowd. He reached him in a few strides and seized him by the tail. But the miniature tiger conquered his liberty by a blow of his paw and escaped into the woods again. They followed him to the plain. Long, long was the road already traversed. Immense was the plain which spread out like a chessboard before the hunters and their prey. The heat of the day was oppressive. Great black clouds were piled up in the west. The sweat rolled down all their faces, but nothing could quench the eagerness of those eight devoted men. Monsieur Lambert, all covered with blood, spurred on his companions by word and deed, People who have never seen a notary chasing his nose cannot have a just idea of his ardor. Goodbye, strawberries and raspberries, farewell gooseberries and currants. Everywhere the avalanche had passed, the hope of the harvest was crushed, destroyed, annihilated. There was nothing left but bruised flowers, torn buds, broken branches, and stalks trampled underfoot. The villagers, surprised by the invasion of this unknown torrent, threw down their watering pots, called their neighbors, cried out to the police, yelled for pay for the damage, and gave chase to the chasers. Victory! The cat is a prisoner. He has thrown himself down a well. Buckets! Ropes! Ladders! They're sure that Monsieur Lambert's nose will be found intact, or nearly so. But alas, this well is not as other wells. It is the opening of an abandoned quarry, whose galleries form a veritable network of more than ten leagues and are connected with the catacombs of Paris. Monsieur Tiquet's fees are paid. All the villagers are paid the indemnities which they claim, and in a heavy rain they start back towards Partenay. Before getting into his carriage, Eva's bay, wet as a duck and entirely cooled down, offered his hand to Monsieur Lambert. Monsieur, said he, I sincerely regret that my obstinacy has pushed things so far. Little Tompin is not worth a single drop of the blood which has been shed for her. I shall give her her dismissal this very day, for I could never see her again without thinking of the unhappiness she has caused. You have yourself seen that I have done my best, as have these gentlemen, to restore you what you have lost. 
nevertheless permit me still to hope that this accident will not prove irreparable the village doctor told us that in paris there are practitioners more skilful than he i think i have heard that modern surgery has infallible secrets for restoring parts mutilated or destroyed m lambert with bad enough grace accepted the faithful hand which was offered him and with his two friends started back for the faubourg saint germain End of section two read by sandra near montreal twenty twenty two chapter three of the notary's nose this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit librivox dot org the notary's nose by edmund abou translated by henry holt chapter three in which the notary takes care of his skin more successfully. An unqualifiedly happy man was the coachman of Eva's Bay. That veteran Paris gamin probably took less delight in the fifty francs drink money than in the pleasure of having led his patron to victory. "'Beg pardon, your honour," said he to our good Eva's. "'How you does polish people off! It's really worth knowing about!' If ever I treads on your toes, I makes my manners in short order. That poor gent wouldn't find it very handy to take a pinch of snuff now. Well, well, if anybody ever tells me as Turks is scrubs, I'll have something to answer back. I brought you good luck, as I said I would. Well, my prince, I know an old chap from near Bion, who's different every day from me. He brings bad luck to folks as he carries. Just as many as he puts into the field, just so many gets done up. Glang, old girl, let's go to glory. The horses on the carousel can't make out as their cousin's yours today. These rather cruel witticisms could not cheer up the three Turks. The cabman amused nobody but himself. In a carriage infinitely better in its appointments and horses, the notary bewailed himself before his friends. "'It is all up with me,' he said. "'I'm about as good as a dead man. "'There's nothing left for me to do but blow my brains out. "'It will not do for me to go into society any more, "'nor to the opera, nor to any of the theatres. "'You would not have me display to the eyes of the universe "'a grotesque and pitiable figure "'which would excite laughter in some and pity in others.' Ugh, answered the Marquis. The world gets used to everything, and at the very worst, if you're afraid of the world, you can stay at home. Stay at home? A fine prospect. Do you believe, then, that the women would come to pay court to me at home, in the beautiful condition in which I am? You'll get married. I knew a lieutenant of cuirassier who had lost an arm, a leg, and an eye. He was not exactly a pet of the petticoats, but he married a nice girl, neither ugly nor pretty, who loved him with all her heart and made him perfectly happy. M. Lambert undoubtedly found this prospect not the most consoling in the world, for he cried out in a voice of despair, "'Oh, women! Women! Women!' "'Bless me,' said the Marquis, "'how your compass does turn toward the women. "'Women are not everything. "'There's something else in the world. "'Why the devil shouldn't a man work out his salvation? "'He can enlarge his soul, cultivate his mind, "'help his fellow creatures, "'and discharge the duties of his position. "'It's not necessary to have a nose of any given length "'and be a good Christian, a good citizen, and a good notary.' "'Notary?' answered the victim with ill-concealed bitterness. Yes, I'm still that. Yesterday I was a man, a man of the world, a gentleman, and even, I may as well say it without any false modesty, reasonably popular among the ladies of the best society. Today I'm nothing but a notary, and who knows that I shall be even that tomorrow." It only requires an indiscretion in my valet to noise about this foolish affair. Why, if a newspaper were to say two words about it, the authorities would be obliged to prosecute my adversary and his seconds and yourselves, gentlemen. Just imagine us in a police court recounting to the tribunal where and why I followed Mademoiselle Victorine Pompin. Fancy such a scandal, and tell me if my notaryship would survive it. My dear boy, 
answered the Marquis. You scare yourself over imaginary dangers. People of our degree, and you are one to some extent, have the right to cut each other's throats with impunity. The authorities shut their eyes to our quarrels, and that is justice. I understand that they bother journalists a little, and artists and other individuals of inferior condition, when they venture to touch a sword. It's just as well to remind such people that they have fists to pound each other with, and that such weapons are good enough to avenge the kind of honour which they possess. But when a gentleman acts as a gentleman, the authorities have nothing to say, and they say nothing. I have had fifteen or twenty such affairs since I left the service, and some of them turned out rather badly for my adversaries. Have you ever seen my name in the police gazette? Monsieur Steinbourg was less intimate with Monsieur Lambert than the Marquis de Villemarin was. He had not, like the Marquis, had all his title deeds in the office in the Rue de Vermeuil for four or five generations. He did not even know the two other gentlemen, except at the club, and at whist parties possibly too, through some commissions which the notary had thrown in his way. But he was a good fellow, and a man of sense, and he indulged in his turn in a considerable expenditure of words, reasoning with and consoling his unhappy friend. As was natural to him, the Marquis de Villemarin had put the worst face on matters. There was still something left to fall back upon. To say that M. Lambert had got to remain disfigured his whole life was to put too little confidence in science. What would be the use of being born in the nineteenth century if the least accident could become, as in olden times, an irreparable misfortune? Where would be our superiority over the people of the Golden Age? Do not let us blaspheme against the sacred name of progress. Operative surgery, thank God, is more flourishing than ever in the land of Ambroise Paris. That old fellow, back at Parthenay, named several skilful men who patch up the human body successfully. Here we are at the gates of Paris. We'll send to the nearest drug store, where they will give us the address of Elpo or Huguier. Your footman will run for the great man and bring him to your house. I'm sure I've heard that surgeons replace a lip, an eyelid, and even an ear. Is it more difficult, then, to restore the tip of the nose? This help was rather vague. Nevertheless, it encouraged the poor notary, who had not been bleeding for half an hour, and the idea of becoming what he was before and taking up his old course of life threw him into a sort of ecstasy. So true is it that we never realize the fullness of happiness until we have lost it. "'Ah, my friends!' he cried, kneading his hands into each other. "'My fortune belongs to the man who will cure me!' No matter what torments I must undergo, I will pour out money with all my heart, if I can be certain of success, and I will no more spare suffering than expense. In this frame of mind, he got back to the Rue de Vermeuil, while his footman had gone to get some addresses of celebrated surgeons. The Marquis and Monsieur de Steinbourg conducted him to his chamber and took their leave, one to go and relieve the anxiety of his wife and daughters, whom he had not seen since the preceding evening, the other to hasten to the bourse. Left alone beside the great Venetian glass which pitilessly reflected his new aspect, Alfred Lambert fell into a profound melancholy. This strong man who never wept at the theatre because it is vulgar, this gentleman with a face of bronze who had buried his father and mother with the most serene composure, wept over the mutilation of his handsome person, and bathed himself in selfish tears. His footman diverted him from this bitter grief by promising a call from M. Bernier, surgeon of the Hôtel Dieu, member of the Surgical Society, and of the Academy of Medicine, clinical professor, etc., etc., etc. The servant had run to the nearest surgeon in the Rue de Bach, and he did not happen on a bad one. M. Bernier, if he was not quite the peer of Velpeau, Manec, and Huguier, occupied a very honourable rank immediately below them. "'Why doesn't he come?' cried M. Lambert. "'Why isn't he here now? Does he think I am to be kept waiting?' 
and he began weeping harder than ever, weeping before his servants. Can a mere sabre stroke so change a man's ways? Certainly it would seem that the weapon of our good Avaz in transversing the nasal canal must have laid open the lacrimal duct and the glands themselves. The notary dried his eyes and examined a huge volume which had been brought him in great haste from M. Steinbourg. It was Ringuet's Chirurgie Operatoire, an excellent manual, and embellished with about three hundred engravings. M. Steinbourg had bought the book on his way to the Bourse, and sent it to his friend, undoubtedly with a view to encouraging him. But the effect of reading it was entirely different from what he had hoped. When the notary had run over a couple of hundred pages, when he had seen defiled before his eyes a lamentable series of ligatures, amputations, resections, and cauterizations, he dropped the book and threw himself on the sofa with closed eyes. Though his eyes were shut, he continued to see skin laid open, muscles held aside by hooks, limbs cut into by great strokes of the knife, and bones sawed by the hands of invisible operators. The patient's faces seemed, as they always do in anatomical designs, calm, stoical, and indifferent to suffering. And he asked himself if such a degree of courage could ever have found place in the human soul. Oftener than anything else, his fancy pictured a little surgeon on page 89, dressed entirely in black, with a velvet collar on his coat. This fantastic creature with a round head, rather vigorous aspect, bald forehead, and serious face, was intently sawing away at the two lower leg bones of a living man. Monster! cried Monsieur Lambert. At the same instant, he beheld the monster enter in person, and Monsieur Bernier was announced. The notary fled backwards to the darkest corner of his room, staring with haggard eyes, and holding his hands out before him as if to keep off an enemy. His teeth chattered, and he murmured in a smothered voice, just as they do in the romances of the Monsieur Xavier de Montepin, the words, "'Tis he! Tis he! Tis he!' "'Monsieur,' said the doctor, "'I regret having made you wait, and I beg you to compose yourself. I understand the accident which has befallen you, and I don't believe that the misfortune is irremediable. But we can do no good if you are afraid of me.' Fear is a suggestion which sounds disagreeably to French ears. Monsieur Lambert straightened himself up, marched directly to the doctor, and said to him with a little laugh, rather too nervous to be natural, Parbleu! Doctor, you're joking with me. Do I look like a man who is subject to fear? If I were a coward, I would not have myself abbreviated this morning in such a strange fashion. But while I was waiting for you, I looked over a book of surgery. My eye had just lit on a figure which resembles you. You came upon me like a ghost. Add to the surprise this morning's emotions, and possibly to a slight touch of fever, and you can excuse anything strange there may have been in my welcome. All right, said Monsieur Bernier, taking up the book. Ah, you were reading, Ranguet. He is one of my friends. I remember, in fact, that he had me engraved to the life from a sketch by Leveillé. But sit down, I beg of you. The notary recovered himself a little and recounted the occurrences of the day, without forgetting the episode of the cat who had made him, as it were, lose his nose a second time. "'That is a misfortune,' said the surgeon, "'but we can remedy it in a month. As you happen to have Ranguet's little book, you are not altogether ignorant of surgery?' Monsieur Lambert declared that the operation to which he had been subjected that morning comprised his whole knowledge of the subject. "'Well,' replied Monsieur Bernier, "'I can give you some ideas in a few words.' Rhinoplasty is the art of restoring the nose for people who have been imprudent enough to lose it. Is it true, then, doctor? The miracle is possible. Surgery has found a way to— She has found three. But I set aside the French method, which is not applicable to the present case. If the loss of substance were less, I could scrape out the edges of the wound and make them raw again, bring them together and reunite them as they were at first. But we can't dream of that. I'm very glad of it responded the wounded man. You can hardly realize, doctor, how such words as scrape out and make raw again grate on my nerves. 
Let's go on to a more gentle method, I beg of you. Surgeons seldom depend on gentleness. But to come to the point, you can choose between the Indian method and the Italian method. The first consists in cutting a sort of triangle out of the skin of your forehead, the apex at the bottom and the base at the top. That is the material for the new nose. This entire piece is turned down, except the little connection at the bottom, which ought to remain adherent. Then it is turned over, so as to still leave the epidermis outside and its edges sewed to the corresponding outline of the wound. In other words, I can make you quite a presentable nose at the expense of your forehead. The success of the operation is almost certain, but your forehead will always bear a large scar. I don't want any scar, doctor. I don't want it at any price. I even go so far, pardon me this weakness, as not to want any operation. I've already been subjected to one today at the hands of that accursed Turk, and I've no desire for another. At the very recollection of that sensation, my blood freezes. I've as much courage as gentlemen in general, but I have nerves, too. I don't fear death, but I have a horror of suffering. Kill me, if you will, but for God's sake, don't hack me up. Monsieur, replied the doctor with a touch of irony, if you have taken such an aversion to operations, you should not call in a surgeon, but a homeopath. Don't make fun of me. I can't bring myself to endure the idea of this Indian operation. The Indians are savages, and their surgery is worthy of them. Didn't you mention an Italian method? I don't like the Italians politically. They're an ungrateful people whose conduct toward their legitimate masters has been the very blackest. But as far as science goes, I have not such a bad idea of the rascals. So be it. We settle on the Italian method. It cures sometimes, but it requires a patience and an immobility of which perhaps you are not capable. If it requires nothing but patience and immobility, I can answer for myself. Are you a man to keep still for thirty days in an extremely uncomfortable position? Yes. Your nose sewed to your left arm? Yes. Very well. I will cut out of your arm a triangular piece four or five inches long and two or three broad. I... You'll cut that out of me? Certainly. But it's horrible, doctor, to flay me alive. To cut strips out of a living man's skin, it's barbarous. It's like the Middle Ages. It's worthy of Shylock, the Jew of Venice. The wound in the arm is nothing. The difficulty is to stay sewed to yourself for thirty days. As to that, I have no insuperable fear of anything but the stroke of the scalpel. When one has felt the chill of steel entering living flesh. He has enough fear of it for the rest of his days, my dear doctor. He doesn't seek it any more. That being so, monsieur, there's nothing for me to do here. You'll be minus a nose for the rest of your life. Such a sentence plunged the poor notary into a profound consternation. He tore his beautiful blonde hair and raved around the chamber like a crazy man. Mutilated, he cried, weeping, "'Mutilated forever, and nothing can retrieve my fate. "'If there were some drug, some mysterious substance "'whose virtue restores noses to people who have lost them, "'I must buy it for its weight in gold. "'I would send and have it searched for even to the ends of the earth. "'Yes, I would fit out a vessel if it were absolutely necessary, "'but there's nothing. "'What's the use of my being rich?' What's the use of your being an illustrious operator, since all your skill and all my sacrifices end in this stupid failure? Riches! Science! Empty words! Monsieur Bernier reiterated to him from time to time, with imperturbable calmness, Let me cut a little slice out of your arm, and I will restore your nose. One moment, Monsieur Lambert seemed to be decided. He took off his coat and rolled up his shirt-sleeves. But when he saw the surgeon's case open, when the polished instruments of torture glistened before his eyes, he grew pale, felt faint, and fell upon a chair in a sort of swoon. A few drops of diluted vinaigre restored his senses, but not his resolution. "'There's no use thinking about it any more,' said he, arranging his clothes. Our generation has all sorts of courage, but it is weak before suffering. It's the fault of our parents who brought us up wrapped in cotton. 
A few minutes later, this young man, imbued with the most religious principles, began to blaspheme against providence. Indeed, he cried, this world is a lovely bear garden. I congratulate the creator on it. I have two hundred thousand francs income, and here I am as flat-nosed as a skull, while my porter, who has not two crowns in the world, has the nose of the Apollo Belvedere. Omniscience, which has foreseen everything, has not foreseen that I should have my nose cut off by a Turk for having spoken to Mademoiselle Tompin. There are three million beggars in France, not one of whose whole bodies is worth ten sous. But I can't buy the nose of any one of the wretches for any amount of gold. But indeed, why not? His face beamed with a ray of hope, and he continued in a more subdued tone. My old uncle at Poitiers, in his last sickness, had a quantity of Breton blood injected into his veins. A faithful servant made the sacrifice essential to the experiment. My grand-aunt de Giromagny, when she was still beautiful, had a front tooth taken from her prettiest chambermaid to replace a tooth which she herself had lost. The graft took very well, and cost only three louis. Doctor, you have told me that hadn't it been for the veracity of that infernal cat, you could have sewed my nose on again while it was warm. Did you say so, yes or no? Certainly, I say it still. Very well. If I buy some poor devil's nose, could you just as well graft it on the middle of my face? I could. Bravo! But I won't do it, and none of my colleagues would do it any more than I. And why not, if you please? Because to mutilate a healthy man is a crime, even if the patient were stupid enough or hungry enough to consent to it. Upon my soul, doctor, you confound all my notions of justice and injustice. For a hundred louis, I got as my substitute in the army a sort of an Alsatian with a big brown beard. My man, it certainly was mine, had his head carried off by a cannonball on the 30th of April, 1849. As the cannonball in question was incontestably intended for me, I may say that the Alsatian sold me his head and his whole body for a hundred louis. Possibly a hundred fifty. The state not only tolerated, but approved this agreement. You have not found anything against it. Possibly you have yourself bought another man who will get himself killed for you. And when I offer to give double that amount to the first loafer that comes along for the mere piece of his nose, you cry out, scandalous. The doctor hesitated an instant to find some logical reply, but not finding what he wanted, he said, Monsieur Lambert, Although my conscience does not permit me to disfigure a man for your benefit, it does seem to me that I can, without doing anything wrong, cut out of some poor fellow's arm the few square inches of skin which you need. Eh, my dear doctor? Get it where you please, provided you repair this stupid accident. Let's find some good young fellow at once, and long live the Italian method. I warn you again that you will be under treatment a month. Well, what? difference does the treatment make? I shall be at the green room of the opera in a month. Maybe. Have you any man in mind, this concierge of whom you were speaking just now? Very well. He and his wife and his children could be bought for a hundred crowns. When Barbaro, my old concierge, went off, I don't know where to live on his income, a client recommended this fellow, who was literally dying of hunger. Monsieur Lambert rang for his valet, and told him to bid Senguet the new concierge, to come up. The man hastened in, and uttered a cry of fright on seeing his master's face. He was a genuine specimen of the Parisian poor devil, the poorest of all poor devils, a little man of thirty-five whom you would have taken for sixty, so dried up was he, yellow and stunted. Monsieur Bernier examined him at every joint, and pretty soon sent him back to his lodge. "'That fellow's skin isn't good for anything,' said the doctor. "'Don't you remember that gardeners take their grafts from the healthiest and most vigorous trees? Pick me out some sound fellow among your servants. There must be one.' "'Yes, but you're taking things rather as a matter of course. The servants in my house are all of them gentlemen. They are men of capital, have money in bank, buy long and sell short, as all servants do in good houses.' I don't know any of them who would like to sell his blood for money when he makes it so easily at the bourse. 
but possibly you may find one who from devotion... Devotion? Those fellows? <laughs> You're joking, doctor. Our fathers had devoted servants. We've nothing but rascally hirelings, and at bottom, perhaps, we deserve them. Our fathers, being loved by their dependents, felt obligated to give them some affection in return. They put up with their faults, nursed them in their illnesses, and took care of them in their old age. And a devil of a job it was. As for me, I pay my people to do my work, and when the work is not well done, it's no business of mine whether it is indifference, old age, or sickness. I send them off. Then we shan't find the man we want in your household. Do you think of anyone else? Me? Nobody. Still, it's easy enough. The first fellow that happens along, the commissionaire at the corner, or the water carrier that I hear crying down in the street. He took his spectacles from his pocket, raised the curtain a little, peered down the Rue du Bonne, and said to the doctor, There's a fellow who doesn't look badly. Will you be kind enough to motion to him? for I don't dare show myself to the people passing by. Monsieur Bernier opened the window at the moment when the destined victim was crying at the top of his voice, Water! 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 My boy, said the doctor, leave your cask and come up here through the Rue de Verneuil. There's money to be made. End of chapter 3 Section 4 of The Notary's Nose. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Notary's Nose by Edmond Abou. Translated by Henry Holt. Sebastien Romagné. He called himself Romagné, the name his father bore. His sponsors in baptism had given him the name of Sébastien, but as he was a native of frognac les mauriac in the department of Cantal, he invoked his patron saint under the name of Saint-Sébastien. There is every reason to believe that he would have written his first name with an S-H, but fortunately he did not know how to write. This child of Auvergne had reached the age of twenty-three or four years, was built like a Hercules, large, stout, thick-set, deep-chested, big-boned, florid, strong as an ox, good-natured, and as easy to lead as a little white lamb. Imagine the most substantial sort of a man, the most clownish fellow in the world, and at the same time the best disposed. He was the oldest of ten children, boys and girls, all living, thriving, swarming under the paternal roof, his father had a hut, a bit of land, a few chestnut trees on the mountain, a few dozen hogs year in and year out, and two arms to delve in the earth. His mother spun flax. The little boys helped the father and the little girls took care of the house and brought each other up, the oldest girl acting as nurse to the girl next her, and so on to the bottom of the ladder. The young Sebastian did not actually blaze with intelligence or memory or any other gift of the intellect, but he had heart enough and to spare. He had been taught a few chapters of the catechism, just as blackbirds are taught to whistle, Polly put the kettle on, but he really had and always did have the most Christian principles, and always lived up to them. He never abused his strength with man or beast. He avoided quarrels and got many a rap without returning it. If the sub-prefect of Mauriac had wanted to give him a silver medal, he would only have had to write to Paris, for Sébastien had saved several people at the risk of his life, and especially two gendarmes who were drowning with their horses in the torrent of Sommeil. But people took these things as a matter of course, just as if he had done them by instinct, and no one any more dreamed of rewarding him than if he'd been a Newfoundland dog. At the age of twenty he drew lots for the conscription and got a good number, of course because of a nine days religious service that he had observed at home, after which he made up his mind to go to Paris, conformably with the manners and customs which prevailed in Auvergne, to make a little money for himself and to help his father and mother. They gave him a velveteen suit and twenty francs, which still made an appreciable sum in the arrondissement of Mauriac, and he embraced the opportunity of a comrade who knew the road to Paris. 
He made the journey on foot in ten days and arrived fresh and well, with twelve and a half francs in his pocket and his new shoes in his hand. A couple of days later, he was dragging a water cask in the Faubourg Saint-Germain, in company with another comrade who could not go up the flights of stairs because he'd strained himself. As the reward of his labours, he was provided with bed, board, and washing at the rate of one shirt a month, and in addition thereto was given thirty sous a week to have a good time on. By saving, he bought, at the end of the year, a water cask of his own, and set up for himself. He prospered beyond all expectation. His naive politeness, inexhaustible good nature, and well-known probity secured him the good graces of the entire neighborhood. The two thousand flights of stairs which he went up and down every day gradually increased to seven thousand. Moreover, he sent sixty francs a month to the good people at Frognac. The family blessed his name and commended him to God morning and evening in their prayers. The little boys had new breeches, and there was talk of nothing less than sending the last two to school. The author of all these blessings had in no way changed his mode of life. He slept beside his cask in a cart-house, and four times a year changed the straw of his bed. The velveteen suit was more patched than a harlequin's dress. Indeed, he would have had to spend very little on dress had it not been for those confounded shoes, which used up three pounds of nails a month. His table expenses were the only ones in which he did not stint himself. He allowed himself without any haggling four pounds of bread a day. Sometimes he even regaled his stomach with a bit of cheese, an onion, or half a dozen apples bought wholesale on the Pont Neuf. Sundays and fete days he did go as far as soup and beef, and licked his fingers all the rest of the week. But he was too good a son and too good a brother to branch out into a glass of wine. Wine, women, and tobacco were fabulous luxuries to him. He only knew them by reputation. A fortiori, he was ignorant of the pleasures of the theatre, so dear to the Paris labourer. My chap preferred going to bed at seven o'clock, gratis, to applauding Monsieur Dumaine for ten sous. Such in mind and body was the man whom M. Bernier hailed in the Rue de Beaune to come and lend some of his skin to M. Lambert. The servants were notified and brought him up as soon as possible. He came in timidly, hat in hand, raising his feet as high as possible, not daring to let them rest on the carpet. The morning storm had spattered him up to the shoulders. "'If it's water that you want,' said he, bowing to the doctor, "'I—' Monsieur Bernier cut him short. "'No, my boy, we don't want anything in your regular line. "'Well, monsieur, is something different, then?' "'Something entirely different. "'This gentleman here had his nose cut off this morning.' Chapristi, poor man, and who did such a thing as that? A Turk, but that's of no consequence. A savage. Folks has told me that Turks was savages, but I didn't know that they let them loose to come to Paris. Just wait a bit. I'll go and get the police. M. Bernier stopped the worthy Auvergnat's outburst of zeal, and in a few words explained the service required of him. He thought at first that they were making fun of him, for a man may be an excellent water-carrier and not have any notion of rhinoplasty. The doctor made him understand that they wanted to buy a month of his time and about four square inches of his skin. "'The operation is nothing,' he said. "'You have very little to suffer.' but I warn you in advance that you will need enormous patience to keep still for a whole month with your arms sewed to monsieur's nose. Ash to patience, he answered. I be enough of that. One is not an obagnat for nothing. But if I stay a month here to do this service to this poor man, my time must be paid at what it's worth. "'That's a matter of course. How much do you wish?' He thought a moment and said, "'On my 
conscience. It's worth a matter of four francs a day. No, my friend, responded the notary. It's worth a thousand francs a month, or thirty-three francs a day. No, spoke up the doctor with authority. It's worth two thousand francs. Monsieur Lambert inclined his head and raised no objection. Romagné asked permission to finish his day's work, put up his cask in the cart house, and seek a substitute for a month. Besides, he said, it's not worth while to commence on an odd half day. They convinced him that the matter was urgent, and he arranged his affairs accordingly. One of his friends was notified and agreed to take his place for the month. You'll fetch me my bread every day, said Romagné. They told him that this precaution was unnecessary and that he could take his meals in the house. That depends on what it costs. Monsieur Lambert will feed you gratis. Gratis? You mean you'll throw it in? Here's my skin cut away. He endured the operation like a hero without wincing. It is a pleasure, he said. They told me of an Obernat down my way, who let himself get covered over with stone. They call it petrified, in a spring for twenty shoes an hour. I rather get myself cut up piecemeal. It is less confining, and agrees with me better. Monsieur Bernier sewed his left arm to the notary's face, and the two men remained for a month fastened to each other. The Siamese twins, who used to amuse the curiosity of Europe, were not more indissoluble, but they were brothers, accustomed from childhood to put up with each other, and they had received the same education. If one had been a water-carrier and the other a notary, possibly they would not have presented the spectacle of so fraternal a friendship. Romagné never complained of anything, although the situation seemed somewhat novel. He yielded as a slave, or rather as a Christian, to all the whims of the man who had bought his skin. He got up and sat down, laid down, turned to the right or left according to the caprice of his lord. The needle is not more constant to the pole than Romagny was in his submission to Monsieur Lambert. This heroic gentleness touched the notary's heart, which was nevertheless by no means tender. For three days he experienced a sort of gratitude for his victim's kindness, but he was not very slow in conceiving a distaste for him, then disgust, then horror. A young man, active and healthy, never can easily accustom himself to absolute immobility. What must it be, then, when he's forced to remain in fixed association with a creature, coarse, inferior, and without education? But the die was cast and he had to live without a nose or put up with the Auvergne and all his consequences, to eat with him, sleep with him, to perform every function of life with him at hand and in the most awkward positions. Romagné was a worthy and excellent young man, but he snored like an organ. He adored his family and loved his neighbor, but he never took a bath for fear of wasting the commodity he dealt in. His sentiments were the most delicate in the world, but he did not know how to impose upon himself the most elementary constraints which civilization prescribes for us. Poor Monsieur Lambert! Poor Romagné! What nights and days! What kicks given and received! It is unnecessary to say that Romagné received them without complaining— his greatest fear was that some wrong motion might spoil Dr. Bernier's experiment. The notary received a good many visits. His boon companions came to see him and made sport of the Auvergnat. They taught him to smoke cigars and drink wine and brandy, and the poor devil gave himself up to these pleasures with the innocence of a savage. They got him tipsy. They got him drunk. They made him descend all the steps which separate man from the brute. The fellow needed education, and these fine gentlemen took a great deal of pleasure in giving it to him. Was it not something new and agreeable to ruin an Auvergne? One day one of them asked him how he intended to use Monsieur Lambert's hundred louis when he should have earned them. I'll place them at five per cent, he answered, and I'll get a hundred francs interest. 
And after that, queried a nice little millionaire of twenty-five years, will you be richer? Will you be happier? You will have six sous income a day, if you marry, as is inevitable, for you're made of the timber they make fools of. You'll have a dozen youngsters at least. Yes, it's possible. And under the civil code, which is a fine invention of the empire, you'll leave each of them two farthings a day to live on. And all this in spite of the fact that with the two thousand francs you can live like a rich man for a whole month, experience the pleasures of life, and rise above your equals. He struggled like a good fellow against these attempts to corrupt him, but he received so many repeated taps on his thick head that they opened a passage for the false ideas, and his brain was upset. The ladies came, too. Monsieur Lambert knew a great many, and of all descriptions. Romagné was present at a great variety of scenes. He heard protestations of love and fidelity which rather lacked probability. Not only did Monsieur Lambert unhesitatingly tell lies before him with the greatest freedom, but he sometimes amused himself when they were alone together by teaching him the deceptions which are, so to speak, the canvas on which fashionable life is embroidered. And the world of business, Romagné thought he'd discovered it like Christopher Columbus, for he never had any idea of such things before. The clients in the office kept no more guard over their conversation before him than if he had been an oyster. He saw fathers of families who were seeking ways to rob their sons, under forms of law, for the sake of mistresses, for speculation. Young men about to marry, who were trying to learn the art of stealing their wife's dowry, under the marriage contract. Lenders who wanted twenty per cent on first mortgages, and borrowers who gave mortgages where there was no value. He had not a bit of imagination, nor much more intelligence than a poodle, but his conscience was sometimes shocked. One day he saw fit to say to Monsieur Lambert, You have not my esteem. And the repugnance the notary had for him changed into open hate. The last week of their forced intimacy was filled with a series of tempests, but at length M. Bernier announced that the strip of skin had taken root in spite of innumerable wrenches. He cut the two enemies apart and shaped the notary a nose out of the skin which no longer belonged to Romagné, and the handsome millionaire of the Rue de Verneuil threw two one-thousand-franc notes to his slave, saying, "'Be gone, you scoundrel!' The money is nothing. You've made me spend five thousand francs worth of patience. Clear out. Leave here forever. Don't let me ever hear of you again. Romagné thanked him with dignity, drank a bottle of wine in the servants' hall, two glasses of brandy with Sanguet, and started off reeling toward his old abiding place. End of chapter four. Read by Sandra, near Montreal, 2022. Chapter 5 of The Notary's Nose. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Notary's Nose by Edmund Abou. Translated by Henry Holt. Chapter 5 Pride and a Fall. Monsieur Lambert went back into society with success, one might say with glory. His seconds did him very ample justice in saying that he had fought like a lion. The old notaries were made young again by his courage. Eh, 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 see what sort of fellows we are when we're driven to extremities. In being a notary, one is none the less a man. Master Lambert has been betrayed by the fortune of arms, but he was noble to fall in such a way. It was a Waterloo. There's good stuff in us yet. Never mind what folks say. So spoke the respectable Master Clopineau, and the worthy Master Labrique, and the unctuous Master Bontou, and all the nesters of the notarial profession. The young masters held pretty near the same language, with certain variations inspired by jealousy. "'We don't want to say anything against Master Lambert. He is an honour to us, certainly, although he does compromise us a little. 
and the others would have shown just as much pluck and possibly less awkwardness an officer of the law ought not to permit himself to be trodden under foot at the same time he ought not to give the first offence he ought to fight only for reasons that can be talked about anywhere if i were the father of a family i would rather entrust my business to a steady fellow than to a knight errant etc 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 but the opinion of the ladies which makes law was decidedly in favour of the hero of Pathenay. possibly it would have been a little less unanimous if they had known the episode of the cat possibly indeed the unjust and charming sex would have declared m lambert in the wrong if he had permitted himself to return to the gaze of the world without a nose but all the seconds had kept the ridiculous side of the affair strictly to themselves moreover m lambert far from being disfigured appeared to have gained by the change a baroness remarked that his expression was much sweeter since he had been wearing a straight nose an old canoness who was kept preserved in malice asked the prince de Beu if it would not be a good idea to go off pretty soon and pick a quarrel with a turk prince de Beu's aquiline nose enjoyed an immense reputation some one will ask how ladies in society could feel any interest in dangers which had not been incurred for them m lambert's habits were known and it was no secret how large a portion of his time and his heart was expended at the opera but the world easily pardons these little aberrations in men who do not give themselves up to them altogether it is wise to be satisfied with half a loaf rather than go without bread it seemed well enough that m lambert should go halfway to perdition while so many men of his age went the whole he never neglected good houses he talked with the dowagers and danced with the young girls he occasionally made passable music and never talked horse these merits so rare among young millionaires of the faubourg secured him the good will of the ladies it was even said that more than one had thought she was doing the lord's service in entering the lists against the ballet green room one pretty pious woman madame de Le, had proved to him for three whole months that the keenest pleasures are not to be found in scandal and dissipation nevertheless he had never broken off with the corps de ballet the severe lesson he had received did not inspire him with any horror of that hydra with a hundred pretty heads one of his first visits was to the green room where shone mademoiselle victorine tampin there indeed they gave him a fine reception with what friendly curiosity they gathered around him how they called him the dearest fellow and so nice what cordial grasps of the hand what pretty little beaks were stuck up to him to receive an innocent friendly kiss he was radiant all his old boon companions all the dignitaries in the freemasonry of pleasure complimented him on his miraculous cure for a whole entracte he reigned in this agreeable kingdom they listened to the account of his duel they made him describe dr bernier's treatment and they admired the delicacy of the lines of suture which could hardly be seen at all just fancy said he that that excellent m bernier pieced me out with the skin of an auvergnat and such an auvergnat good god the stupidest thickest-headed, dirtiest fellow of all Auvergne. You would not suspect it from seeing the piece of himself that he sold me. The beast made me pass many disagreeable hours. The commissionaires at the corners of the street are dandies compared with him. But I'm well rid of him, thank heaven. When I paid him and kicked him out of doors, I was relieved from a heavy burden. His name was Romagné, a touching name, don't ever pronounce it before me. Nobody will say Romagné to me if he wants me to live. Romagné! Mademoiselle Victorine Tampin was not the last to compliment the hero. Ives Bey had infamously abandoned her, leaving her four times as much money as her merits justified. The handsome notary showed himself amiable and forgiving toward her. 
I bear you no ill will, he said. I haven't even any grudge against that brave Turk. I have only one enemy in the world, and he is an Auvergnat by the name of Romagné. He said Romagné with an intonation comic enough to make his fortune on the stage, and I believe that even to this day the majority of those girls say Mon Romagné when they speak of their water carriers. Three months passed. Three months of summer. The season was beautiful, and few people had remained in Paris. The opera was invaded by strangers and people from the country. Monsieur Lambert appeared there less frequently. Almost every day at six he laid aside his official gravity and hurried off to Maison Lafitte, where he had hired a cottage. His friends went there to see him, even some of those from the green room. They played at all sorts of outdoor games in the garden, and I can assure you that the swing was not left hanging idle. One of his most frequent and liveliest visitors was Monsieur Steinburg, the broker. The Parthenay affair had brought him into closer intimacy with Monsieur Lambert. Monsieur Steinburg belonged to a good family of converted Jews. Their family estate was worth two millions. He had the right to quarter of it himself. It was proper, then, to hold close relations with him. The mistresses of the two friends got along very well, that is to say they did not quarrel more than once a week at most. How beautiful to see four hearts which beat as one! The men went riding, read Figaro, or retailed the town gossip. The women took turns in telling fortunes by cards in the most entertaining way. The golden age in miniature! M. Steinburg made it his duty to present his friend to his family. He took him to Bieville, where the elder Steinburg had built himself a chateau. M. Lambert was graciously received by a very hale old gentleman, a lady of fifty-two who had not yet abdicated, and two young girls who were finished coquettes. The girls had seen everything played at the theatres, and read everything written in books. Few people knew better than they the fashionable gossip of Paris. They had had pointed out to them at the play, and in the Bois de Bouillon, the most celebrated beauties of all circles. They had been taken to see some elegant establishments, sold out, and they could descant most agreeably on Mademoiselle X's emeralds and the Mademoiselle Z's pearls. The elder, Mademoiselle Irma Steinburg, copied the toilettes of Mademoiselle Fergueil with passionate enthusiasm. The younger had sent one of her friends to Mademoiselle Figiac to ask the address of her dressmaker. Both were rich and would have good dowries. Monsieur Lambourg took a fancy to Irma. The handsome notary occasionally said to himself that half a million dowry and a woman who knows how to dress are not things to be sneezed at. He was to be seen there pretty often almost once a week, even up to the early November frosts. After a mild and pleasant autumn, winter came down like an avalanche, a circumstance common enough in our climate, but Monsieur Lambert's nose at this time manifested a sensibility not quite so common. It reddened a little, then a great deal, and swelled up by degrees almost to the point of deformity. After a hunting party that had been kept in high spirits by the north wind, the notary experienced an intolerable itching. He looked in the glass at an inn, and found the color of his nose not at all to his taste. You would have called it a chilblain in the wrong place. He consoled himself with the thought that a good hot fire would bring back its natural appearance, and in fact it did relieve his nose and restore its color for a few moments but the itching returned the next day. The tissues swelled up enormously, and the red color reappeared with a slight addition of violet. A week passed in the house before the fireplace effaced the fatal tint, but it reappeared the first time he went out in spite of his gray fox furs. This time Monsieur Lambert got frightened and sent post-haste for Monsieur Bernier. The doctor hurried to him, called it a slight inflammation, and prescribed compresses of ice water. This eased the nose, but by no means cured it. M. Bernier was astonished at the stubbornness of the disorder. After all, said he, 
Perhaps Diefenbach is right. He claims that the strip we cut off can die from excess of blood, and leeches ought to be applied to it. We'll try it. The notary suspended a leech from the end of his nose. When it fell off, gorged with blood, it was replaced by another, and so on for two days and nights. The swelling and discoloration disappeared for a time, but the improvement was not of long duration. Something else was needed. M. Bernier asked for twenty-four hours for reflection, and took forty-eight. When he returned to the house in the Rue de Verneuil, he was anxious and even timid, and it cost an effort to master himself before saying to M. Lambert, "'Medicine does not embrace all natural phenomena, and I have come to submit to a theory which has no scientific character.' My colleagues would perhaps make sport of me if I were to tell them that a piece taken from a man's body can remain under the influence of its former possessor. It is your blood propelled by your heart under the action of your brain which has this unfortunate tendency to your nose. Nevertheless, I am tempted to believe that that booby of an Auvergnat is not a stranger to the circumstance." M. Lambert exclaimed against this loudly. The idea that that vile mercenary whom he had paid, and whom he owed nothing, could exercise an occult influence on the nose of a government official was almost an impertinence. It's worse, answered the doctor. It's an absurdity. Nevertheless, I want you to let me go and hunt up Romagné. I want to see him today, if for no other reason, to convince myself of my error. Have you kept his address? God forbid! Very well. I'll go and try to find him. Keep your patience and stay in your room and don't doctor yourself any more. He hunted for a fortnight. The police came to his aid and kept him off the track three weeks. Half a dozen Romagniers were found. A detective of great experience unearthed all the Romagniers in Paris except the one they wanted. They found a retired soldier, a dealer in wolfskins, a lawyer, a thief, a dry goods clerk, a gendarme, and a millionaire. M. Lambert was before his fire fairly broiling with impatience and contemplating his scarlet nose with despair. At last they found the place where the water carrier used to live. He was not there any more. The neighbors said that he had made his fortune, sold his cask, and gone off to enjoy life. M. Bernier beat through taverns and other haunts of pleasure, while his patient stayed at home plunged in melancholy. On the 2nd of February, at ten o'clock in the morning, the handsome notary was sadly toasting his feet and squintingly contemplating the blooming peony in the centre of his face, when a joyous tumult disturbed the whole house. The doors opened with a bang, the valets cried out with surprise, and at last the doctor appeared, leading Romagné by the hand. It was the genuine Romagné, but very different from himself. Dirty, besotted, hideous, with dull eyes and fetid breath, reeking with rum and tobacco, red as a boiled lobster from head to foot, he was less a man than a living erysipelas. Monster, said Monsieur Bernier, you ought to die of shame. You have debased yourself below the brutes. If you still preserve the face of a man, you have no longer the color of one. How have you used the little fortune which we made for you? You have groveled in the lowest depths of debauchery. I found you outside the fortifications of Paris, wallowing like a pig before the door of the dirtiest of taverns. The Auvergnat raised his great eyes toward the doctor, and said in his amiable accent, embellished with an intonation from the Faubourgs, Well... What of it? I've been having a good time. That's no reason for you to talk nonsense to me. What are you calling nonsense? I'm reproaching you for your misdeeds, that's all. Why didn't you invest your money instead of drinking it up? He told me to amuse myself. You rascal, cried the notary. Did I tell you to swill brandy and blue ruin in the stews? Folks amuse themselves, and they can I've been off with my friends. A fine lot they are, your friends. 
Here I make a marvellous cure which spreads my reputation through Paris, which some day or other will open the doors of the Institute to me, and you go with a lot of drunkards of the same sort and spoil my divine work. If you were the only thing concerned, bless me, we would leave you to do what you pleased. It's physical and moral suicide, but an Auvergnat more or less makes no difference to society. The matter concerns a gentleman of consequence, though, a man of property, your benefactor, and my patient. You have compromised him, disfigured, assassinated him by your misconduct. See what a lamentable condition you have brought poor monsieur. The poor devil contemplated the nose which he had furnished and burst into tears. It's very unlucky, Monsieur Bonnier, but I call God to witness it's not my fault. The nose got sick all of itself. Sapristi, I'm an innocent man. I swear to you that I'm not eating touched it. Fool, said Monsieur Lambert, you will never understand, and moreover there's no reason why you should understand. It's only necessary for you to say, without any more words, that you will change your course of conduct and give up this life of debauchery which is killing me by reaction. I give you fair notice that I have a long arm, and that if you persist in your vices I will know how to put you in a safe place. In prison? In prison. In prison with criminals? I see. Monsieur Lambert, that will be a dishonour to my family. Are you going to drink any more, yes or no? Ah, oh, good God, how can a fellow drink when he has not a shoe left? I've spent everything, Monsieur Lambert. I have drunk up my two houses and francs. I have drunk up my cask and all the money I had in the bank, and nobody on the face of the earth would trust me any more. So much the better, you amusing rascal. You've done well. Yes, indeed. I ought to behave myself. Misery is coming upon me, Monsieur Lambert. Time it should. Monsieur Lambert? What? If you would only be so very good and get me a water cask to shut myself up in the world again, I swear to you I would be a good fellow. Get out. You would sell it for drink. No, Monsieur Lambert, on the word of an honest man. On the word of a sot. But do you want me to die, then, of hunger and thirst? A hundred francs, good Monsieur Lambert. Not a centime. Providence has made you miserably poor that you might restore me my natural appearance. Drink water, eat dry bread, go without the necessities of life, die of hunger if you can, for at such a price I should get back my natural advantages and become myself again. Romagny hung his head, and went out scraping his foot and saluting the company. The notary was full of joy, and the worthy doctor was in his glory. "'I don't want to sing my own praises,' modestly said Monsieur Bernier, but Le Verdier, discovering a planet solely through his calculations, accomplished no greater a miracle than I. To divine from the appearance of your nose that an Auvergnat, absent and lost in Paris, had given himself up to debauchery, is to come up from the effect to the cause by roads which human daring has not hitherto attempted. As to the treatment of the disorder, it is indicated by the circumstances. Diet applied to Romagné is the only remedy which can cure you. Chance serves us wonderfully, since the animal has eaten up his last sou. You did well to refuse him the help he begged for. All the efforts of science would be vain if this fellow were to have anything to buy drink with. But, doctor, interrupted Monsieur Lambert, suppose my trouble did not rise from that. If you had been the sport of some fortuitous coincidence, didn't you yourself tell me that the theory I have said and I maintain, that in the present state of our knowledge your case admits of no logical explanation, it is a phenomenon whose law is yet to be discovered? The correspondence that we observe today between the health of your nose and the conduct of this Auvergnat opens a perspective which may be deceitful, but it is certainly immense. Let us wait a few days. If your nose gets well in the same degree as Romagné behaves himself, my theory will receive the additional support of a new probability. 
I don't answer for anything, but I suspect the existence of a law in physiology hitherto unknown, and which I should be happy to formulate. The world of science is full of visible phenomena produced by unknown causes. Why has Madame de Hill, whom you know as well as I, a cherry admirably painted on her left shoulder? Is it as they say, because her mother, while pregnant, had a violent longing for a basket of cherries exposed for sale by Chevet? What invisible artist depicted this fruit on the body of a six-weeks fetus, about the size of an average prawn? How can this special action of the mind upon the body be explained? Why does Madame de L's cherry become sensitive and painful every year about the month of April, when cherries are in blossom? Here are facts, certain, evident, palpable, and just as inexplicable as the swelling and redness of your nose. But patience! Two days later, the swelling on Monsieur Lambert's nose had visibly gone down, but the red color remained. Toward the end of the week, its volume was reduced by a good third. In about a fortnight, the skin peeled off horribly, a new skin appeared, and the nose entirely resumed its original form and color. The doctor was in triumph. "'My only regret,' he said, "'is that we didn't keep Romagné in a cage "'to watch the effect of the treatment upon him "'as we have upon you. "'I'm sure that for a week or so "'he was covered with scales like an adder.' "'May the devil take him,' added Monsieur Lambert, "'in a Christian spirit. "'Thenceforward he resumed his old habits "'and went out in his carriage, on horseback and on foot.' He danced at the balls of the Faubourg, and embellished the green room of the opera with his presence. All the ladies heartily welcomed him, both those in society and out of it. One of those who congratulated him most tenderly on his cure was the elder sister of his friend Steinbourg. That lovely creature was in the habit of considering men just as she considered horses. She very judiciously observed that Monsieur Lambert had come out of his last crisis handsomer than ever. Yes, really it seemed that two or three months of suffering had added some indescribable perfection to his face. The nose, above all, that straight nose which had returned to its proper limits after its painful expansion, appeared finer, whiter, and more aristocratic than ever. This, too, was the handsome notary's own opinion. He contemplated himself in all the glasses with ever-fresh admiration. It was a pleasure to see him face to face with himself, smiling at his own nose. But on the return of spring, in the latter part of March, while the generous sap was distending the lilac buds, M. Lambert had occasion to realize that his nose was the only thing robbed of the benefits of the season and the bounties of nature, Amid the regeneration of everything else, it paled as an autumn leaf. The nostrils pinched and dried up, as it were, under the breath of an invisible sirocco, hung flat against the partition between them which Dr. Bernier had provided. "'By all that's distressing,' said the notary, making a face at himself in the glass, "'an aristocratic appearance is a fine thing, like virtue, but one doesn't want too much of it. My nose is becoming lean to a degree to make one anxious.' and pretty soon it will be nothing more than a shadow if I don't restore its strength and color. He put a little rouge on it, but the color only served to bring out the almost incredible fineness of the straight line, without thickness, which divided his face. Just like the iron blade which rises thin and sharp in the middle of a sundial was the fantastic nose of our desperate notary. In vain, the rich native of the Rue de Verneuil put himself on the most substantial diet, considering that good living digested by a sound stomach benefits all parts of the body nearly equally, he imposed upon himself the agreeable task of taking a great deal of rich soup, a great deal of jelly, and a great deal of rare meat washed down with a great deal of the most generous wines. To say that these select elements did him no good would be to deny the evidence and blaspheme against good cheer. Monsieur Lambert in short time gave himself handsome red cheeks, a fine apoplectic bull neck, and a jolly little fat belly. But the nose remained like a negligent or indifferent partner who did not collect his dividends. When a sick person cannot eat or drink, he is sometimes sustained by nourishing baths, which penetrate through the skin to the sources of life. Monsieur Lambert treated his nose like a patient. 
who must be specially nourished, cost what it will. For its sole behoof, he ordered a little silver-gilt bath. Six times a day he plunged and patiently kept it in baths of milk, burgundy wine, strong soup, and even tomato sauce. The pains were wasted. The patient came out of the bath as pale, thin, and deplorable as it had entered. All hope seemed lost, when one day M. Bernier tapped his forehead and cried, "'We've made an enormous mistake, a regular schoolboy blunder, and that I should do it when the thing brought such a striking confirmation to the support of my theory. There's no doubt of it, monsieur. The Auvergnat is sick, and he is the only patient to treat if we're going to cure you.' Poor M. Lambert tore his hair. Then at last he did regret putting Romagné out of doors, refusing him the help he asked and forgetting to take his address. He imagined the poor devil languishing on a pallet, without bread, without roast beef, and without Chateau Margaux. At this idea his heart was broken. He fancied himself enduring the poor beggar's sufferings. For the first time in his life he was affected by another's misfortune. "'Doctor, dear doctor,' he cried, pressing M. Bernier's hand, "'I'll give all I'm worth to save that excellent young man.' Five days later the disorder had steadily increased. The nose was nothing more than a flexible pellicle, yielding under the weight of the spectacles when M. Bernier came to say that he had found the Auvergnat. "'Victory!' cried M. Lambert. The surgeon shrugged his shoulders and answered that the victory seemed to him at least doubtful. "'My theory,' said he, "'is abundantly confirmed, and as a physiologist I have every reason to declare myself satisfied. But as a doctor I would like to cure you, and the condition in which I found the unhappy fellow leaves me little hope.' "'You will save him, dear doctor?' "'Well, in the first place, he doesn't belong to me. He is under the treatment of one of my colleagues, who is studying him with a certain curiosity.' He'll give him up to you. We'll buy him if necessary. Don't dream of that. Doctors don't sell their patients. They kill them sometimes in the address of science to see what they have inside them, but to make them objects of commerce? Never! Perhaps my friend Fogatier will give me your Auvergne, but the scamp is very sick, and to complete the misfortune he's taken such a distaste for life that he don't care to get well. He throws away all his medicine. As for food, sometimes he complains that he has not enough, and calls out for all he can get with loud cries, and sometimes he refuses what they give him, and asks to be left to die of hunger. "'That's a crime! I'll speak to him! I'll make him listen to the voice of morality and religion! Where is he?' "'At the Hotel Dieu, Ward St. Paul, numéro dix. "'You have your carriage downstairs?' "'Yes.' "'Well!' Let's start. Oh, the depraved wretch, wishing to die. He doesn't seem to know that all men are brothers. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of The Notary's Nose This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org The Notary's Nose by Edmund Abu Translated by Henry Holt Chapter 6. The History of a Pair of Spectacles and the Consequences of a Cold in the Head Never did any preacher, never did Bossuet or Fenelon, never did Massillon or Fléchier, never did Monsieur Mermillot himself dispense from his pulpit eloquence mightier and at the same time more alluring than did Monsieur Alfred Lambert at the bedside of Romagné. First he appealed to the reason, then to the conscience, and finally to the heart of his patient. He called into play arguments both sacred and profane, cited holy writ and the philosophers. He was powerful and gentle, severe and paternal, logical, caressing, and even jocular. He proved that suicide was the most shameful of all crimes, and that one must be very cowardly, voluntarily, to choose death. He even ventured upon a metaphor as new as it was bold, comparing the suicide to the deserter who abandons his post without the permission of his corporal. The Auvergnat, who had not swallowed anything for twenty-four hours, seemed bent on his idea. 
He held himself steady and stubborn before death, like a jackass before a bridge. To the closest argument he responded with imperturbable sweetness. It's not worth while, Monsieur Lambert. There's too much misery in this world. But, my dear friend, misery is a divine institution. It is created expressly to develop charity among the rich and resignation among the poor. Riches! I asked for work, and everybody refused it to me. I asked charity, and they said they'd call the police. Why didn't you appeal to your friends? To me, for instance, to me who wish you well, to me who have your blood in my veins. Just so, so you could pitch me out of doors. My door will be always open to you, and so will my purse, so will my heart. If you'd only let me have fifty francs to buy a new water cask. But you brute. You dear old brute, I would say. <laughs> let me joke with you a little as I did when you shared my bed and table. It's no fifty francs I will give you, but a thousand, ten thousand. My whole fortune I wish to divide with you in proportion to our respective needs. You must live. You must be happy. See, spring has come with her train of flowers and the sweet music of the birds in the branches. Could you have the heart to give up all these? Think of the grief of your excellent parents, of your old father who is awaiting for you in the country, and of your brothers and sisters. Think of your mother, my friend. She would never survive you. You shall see them again. No, not exactly that. You ought to stay in Paris under my eyes in the closest intimacy with me. I want to see you happy, married to a good little wife, father of two or three pretty children. Ah, you smile. Take some of this soup. I'm very thankful to you, Monsieur Lambert. Keep the soup. There's no use taking any more. There's too much misery in this world. But when I swear to you that your evil days are over, that I will take upon myself the responsibility of your future, on my word as a notary, if you consent to live, you shall suffer no more, you shall work no more, your year shall be made up of three hundred and sixty-five Sundays. And no Mondays? All Mondays, if you prefer. You shall eat, you shall drink. You shall smoke cabanas at thirty sous apiece. You shall be my boon companion, my inseparable friend, my other self. Wouldn't you like to live, Romagné, to be my other self? No, so much the worse. As I have commenced to die, I may as well finish up now. Ah, that's it. Very well, I'll tell you, you great brute, to what fate you condemn yourself. It is not merely an affair of the eternal torments that every minute of your stubbornness brings nearer, but in this world, here, tomorrow, today, perhaps, before going to rot, in the potter's field you shall be carried to the dissecting room. They will throw you on a stone table and cut your body to pieces. Some young sawbones will chop open that great ass's head of yours with an axe. Another will ransack your breast with great cuts of a scalpel to find out if there is any heart in that stupid enclosure. Another— Stop! Stop, Monsieur Lambert! I don't want to be cut up in pieces. I'd rather take the soup. Three days on soup, and the strength of his constitution— brought him out of his bad state, and he could be taken in a carriage to the house in the Rue de Verneuil. Monsieur Lambert installed him there himself, as carefully as a mother. He put him in his own valet's room, so as to have him as near himself as possible. For a month he discharged the duties of sick nurse, and even sat up several nights. These fatigues, instead of destroying his health, brought back the freshness and brightness to his face. The more he tasked himself in taking care of the poor devil, the more his nose recovered its firmness and colour. His life was divided between the duties of his office, the Auvergnat, and the mirror. It was during this period that one day he absently wrote on a rough draft of a bill of sale. It is sweet to do good. A maxim somewhat old in itself, but entirely new to him. When Romagné was certainly convalescent, his host and saviour, who had cut off so many slices of bread for him and cut up so many beefsteaks, said, After this we'll dine together every day, though if you would rather eat in the servants' hall you will be well taken care of there and may enjoy it better. Romagné, like a man of sense, 
decided to go with the servants. He fixed himself there and behaved in such a way as to win all hearts. Instead of putting on airs because of the master's friendship, he was more modest and good-natured than the little scullion. In fact, Monsieur Lambert had given his servants a servant. Everybody used him, laughed at his accent, and gave him many a friendly cuff. No one ever dreamed of paying him anything. Monsieur Lambert sometimes happened on him carrying water, moving heavy furniture, or polishing the floors, and on such occasions the good notary pinched his ear and said, "'Amuse yourself, I'm willing, but don't fatigue yourself too much.' The poor fellow was confused by so many kindnesses, and went to his room to weep for gratitude. He could not keep it very long. That large, convenient chamber adjoining the master's apartment, M. Lambert delicately gave him to understand that his valet de chambre needed it very much, and Romagné himself asked permission to lodge in the garret. They were all eagerness to accommodate him, and he got a hole which the kitchen girls had never cared to take. A wise man has said, Happy the people who have no history. Sebastien Romagné was happy three months. Early in June he began to have a history. His heart, long invulnerable, was pierced by the arrows of Cupid. The ex-water carrier gave himself up, bound hand and foot, to the god who destroyed Troy. He became aware while shelling peas that the cook had fine little grey eyes and beautiful big red cheeks. A sigh fit to upset the tables was the first symptom of his disorder. He wished to unbosom himself, but the words stuck in his throat. He scarcely dared catch his Dulcinea around the waist and kiss her on the lips. So excessive was his timidity. He was understood at once. The cook was a capable girl, seven or eight years older than he, and experienced in the affairs of the heart. "'I see what's the matter,' she said. "'You want to marry me. Very well, my boy. We can come to an understanding if you're anything to depend upon.' He answered naively that he had everything to depend upon that could be required of a man, namely two strong arms accustomed to work. Demoiselle Jeannette laughed in his face and spoke more distinctly. He burst out laughing in his turn and said with the most amiable confidence, "'It's money that you want. Why didn't you say so at first? I've got lots of it. Money? How much will you have? Name the sum. Will half Monsieur Lambert's fortune do? Will that be enough? Half of Monsieur's fortune? Certainly, for he's told me so more than a hundred times. Half his fortune's mine, but we'd not divided the cash yet. He's keeping it for me. Nonsense. Nonsense? Stop! Here he comes. I'll go and ask him for my share, and I'll bring the big pennies to you in the kitchen. Poor innocent! He received from his master a good lesson in the grammar of high life. M. Lambert impressed upon him that to promise and to fulfill are not necessarily synonyms. He went so far as to explain, for he was in a good humour, that merits and dangers of the figure of speech called hyperbole, and finally he told him with gentle firmness that admitted of no reply, Romagné, I've done a good deal for you, and I want to do more by sending you away from this house. Good sense must tell you that you're not here as master, and I've too much goodness to let you stay here as servant. In a word, I think I should be doing you a poor service in keeping you in an uncertain position which would spoil your habits and pervert your character. A year or more of this lazy, dependent life, you would lose taste for work, and you would become a man out of place. Now I ought to say to you that men out of their proper places are the curse of our age. Put your hand on your heart and tell me if you would be willing to become the curse of your age. Poor unfortunate fellow! Haven't you more than once sighed for the honest name of laboring man, your title of nobility? For you are one of those whom God has created to ennoble themselves by useful effort. You belong to the aristocracy of labor. Work, then, no longer as you used to in uncertainty and privation, but in security which I will guarantee, and in abundance proportionate to your modest wants. I'll supply money enough to get you established, and I'll get work for you. If, through some impossibility, you should lack the means of living, you will find something to fall back upon wherever I am. But give up this absurd project of marrying my cook. 
for you ought not to bind your lot with that of a servant, and I don't want any children about the house. The unfortunate fellow wept with all his eyes, and overflowed with expressions of gratitude. I ought to say in justice to Monsieur Lambert that he did quite the proper thing. He gave Romagné a fresh outfit of clothing, furnished a chamber on the fifth floor in an old house in the Rue Cherchemidet, and gave him five hundred francs to live upon while waiting for work. A week had not passed before he got him a place in a large looking-glass factory in the Rue de Sèvres. Some time elapsed, perhaps six months, without the notary's nose giving any intelligence of the man who furnished it. But one day, when our man of law, together with his head clerk, was deciphering the parchments of a rich and noble family, his gold spectacles broke in the middle and fell on the table. This little accident did not disturb him much. He took up an eyeglass with a steel spring and sent his spectacles to the Quai des Orfèvres to be exchanged. His optician, M. Luna, took the trouble to send a thousand excuses with a pair of new spectacles which broke before twenty-four hours had passed in the same spot. A third pair met the same fate, and a fourth followed and broke just like them. The optician no longer knew what kind of an excuse to make. In the bottom of his soul he was persuaded that M. Lambert was to blame. He said to his wife, showing her the devastation of the last four days, this young man is not reasonable. He wears number four glasses, which are necessarily very heavy, and through pure dandyism wants the mounting as slender as a thread, and I'm sure he bangs his spectacles about as if they were made of wrought iron. If I were to say anything, he would be put out, but I'm going to send him something in stronger mountings. Madame Luna approved the idea, but the fifth pair of spectacles met the fate of the first four. This time M. Lambert flushed angrily, though nothing had been said to him, and took his custom to a rival house. But it seemed as though all the opticians in Paris had conspired to break their spectacles over the poor millionaire's nose. A dozen pair came to grief there, and the most marvellous thing about it was that an eyeglass with a steel spring, which filled in the interregnums, kept strong and elastic. You know... Patience was not M. Lambert's distinctive virtue. One day he was trampling on a pair of spectacles and mashing them with blows of his heel when Dr. Bernier was announced. Parbleu! cried the notary. You came just in the nick of time. I'm bewitched. The devil is going to fly away with me. The doctor's glances were naturally directed toward his patient's nose. That object appeared sound, well, and fresh as a rose. "'It seems to me,' said he, "'we're getting along very well.' "'I? Undoubtedly. "'But these cursed spectacles won't get along at all.' "'He told his story, "'and M. Bernier was plunged in reflection. "'The Auvergnat is in the case somewhere. "'Have you any of the broken mountings here?' "'There's one under my feet.' M. Bernier gathered it up, examined it with a magnifying glass, and thought that the gold appeared silvered around the place where it was broken. "'The devil! Has Romagné been up to any nonsense?' he said. "'What sort of nonsense do you suppose he had been at?' "'He is always with you?' "'No. The monkey has left me. He's at work in the city.' "'I hope you've kept his address this time.' "'Of course. Would you like to see him?' "'The sooner the better. "'Something dangerous about the place, then. "'Nevertheless, I am very well myself. "'Let's go and see Romagné at once.' "'A quarter of an hour afterwards, "'the gentleman alighted at the door of Monsieur Taillade et Compagnie, Rue de Sèvres. "'A large sign cut out of pieces of glass "'indicated the kind of business carried on in the establishment. "'Here we are,' said the notary. "'What?' "'Your man is employed in there, then?' "'Certainly. I got him the place.' "'Very well. There is less harm done than I thought. "'But nevertheless, you have been guilty of a great imprudence.' "'What are you driving at?' "'Let's go in first. "'The first individual that they encountered in the workshop "'was the Auvergnat, with his shirt-sleeves rolled up, silvering a glass. "'There,' said the doctor, "'I foresaw it clearly. But what?' They silver these glasses with a film of mercury fastened under tinfoil. Do you understand? Not yet. 
That animal of yours is steeped in it up to his elbows. What did I say? Why, he's covered with it up to his armpits. I don't see the connection. You don't see that your nose being a portion of his arm and gold having a deplorable affinity for mercury, it will be always impossible for you to protect your spectacles? Sapristi! But you've the choice of wearing steel spectacles. I don't like them. Well, as matters stand, you risk nothing but a few mercurial accidents. Ah, but no. I'd rather have Romagné do something else. Here, Romagné, stop work and come away with us. Won't you ever get through, you brute? You don't know what you're exposing me to. The proprietor of the shop had run up on hearing the noise. Monsieur Lambert gave his name in an important tone and reminded him that he had recommended this man through his own upholsterer. Monsieur Tayad answered that he remembered it perfectly, that it was for the sake of making himself agreeable to Monsieur Lambert and to merit his goodwill that he had promoted his laborer to silvering glasses. A fortnight ago? queried Lambert. Yes, monsieur. You knew it then? I knew it too well. Ah, monsieur, how anybody can play with such sacred things. I have no nothing. But in my interest, in yours, in the interest of all society, put him where he was. Or rather, no, give him to me so that I can take him away. I'll pay whatever is right, but time presses. Doctor's orders. Romagné, my friend, you must follow me. Your fortune is made. Everything that I have is yours. No? But come just the same. I assure you that I will satisfy you. He scarcely left him time to dress himself and rushed off with him like a beast of prey. Monsieur Tayad and his workmen took him for a crazy man. Romagné, poor fellow, raised his eyes to heaven and asked himself, as they went along, what more they could want with him. His destiny was discussed in the carriage while he chatted with the coachman. "'My dear patient,' said the doctor to the millionaire, "'we must keep sight of this fellow. I understand why you sent him away, for he's not particularly agreeable company, but there's no use in sending him so far, nor in waiting so long without hearing from him.' Settle him in the Rue de Bonne, or the Rue de l'Université, near your house. Give him a business less dangerous to you, or rather, if you feel like it, give him a little pension without putting him at anything. If he works, he tires himself and exposes himself. I don't know any industry in which a man doesn't risk his skin. Accidents come so suddenly. Give him enough to live on without doing anything. Nevertheless, be particularly careful not to put him too much at his ease. He'll take to drink again, and you know what will happen to you. A hundred francs a month, and his rent free. That'll be about enough. Perhaps it's too much. Not as far as the expense is concerned, but I'd like to give him enough to eat without giving him anything to drink. Well, then, try for Louis, payable in four installments, say every Tuesday. Romagné was offered a pension of eighty francs a month, but at first he was reluctant. Is that all? he said with scorn. It wasn't worth while to take me out of the Rue de Chauve. I had three francs ten sous a day, and I sent money to my family. Let me work along the glasses, or give me three francs ten sous. It was absolutely necessary to go that high, for he was master of the situation. Monsieur Lambert soon perceived that he had done a wise thing. The year rolled around without accident of any kind. Romagné was paid every week and watched every day. He lived honestly and peacefully, without any other passion than playing skittles. And Mademoiselle Irma Steinburg's fine eyes reposed with visible complaisance on the pink and white nose of the happy millionaire. These two young people were partners in every German that winter, and so society married them. One evening, coming out of the Théâtre Italien, old Marquis de Villemorin stopped Lambert on the threshold. Well, said he, when is the wedding to be? But, Monsieur le Marquis, I've not heard anything about one yet. Are you going to wait, then, until someone asks you in marriage? It's the man's part to speak. More bleu. Little Duc de Lignon, a perfect gentleman and a good fellow, didn't wait for me to offer him my daughter, not he. He came, I liked him, and the thing was done. Today we signed the contract. You know, my dear boy, that the business side of the affair is for you to attend to. 
Let me put these ladies in the carriage, and we'll walk to the square and have a talk. But why the devil don't you put on your hat? I didn't notice you were holding it in your hand. Ten chances to one you've caught cold. The old man and the young one sauntered along side by side to the boulevard, one talking and the other listening. And Monsieur Lambert went back home to prepare the marriage contract of Mademoiselle Charlotte Auguste de Villemorin. But he had caught a horrible cold, there was no doubt of that. The instrument was sketched out by the head clerk, revised by the businessmen of the two fiancés, and finally engrossed on a beautiful piece of stamped paper to which only the signatures were lacking. On the appointed day, M. Lambert, a slave to duty, went himself to the Hôtel de Virmorin in spite of a persistent influenza which nearly drove the eyes out of his head. In the antechamber he made a final application of his handkerchief, and the lackeys trembled on their benches as if they had heard the trumpet of the last judgment. M. Lambert was announced. He had on his spectacles and smiled gravely, as was his custom under similar circumstances. With a perfectly tied cravat, neatly gloved, shod in pumps as if for a ball, his crush hat under his left arm, the contract in his right hand, he went to pay his respects to the marchioness. Modestly insinuating himself through the group by which she was surrounded, he said to her, Madame la Marquise, I have brought Mademoiselle's contract. The Marquise de Villemorin raised her beautiful eyes in astonishment. A slight murmur ran around the bystanders. Monsieur Lambert bowed again and resumed, Chapristi! Madame la Marquise, it is a lovely day for the young woman. A hand seized him by the left arm and made him turn round. In this performance he recognized the strength of the Marquis. "'My dear notary,' said the old gentleman, leading him to a corner, "'the carnival certainly does permit a good many things, but remember where you are, and change your tone, if you please. "'But Monsieur le Marquis, again, you see that I'm patient. Don't abuse it. Go and make your excuses to the Marquise, read your contract to us, and then good night.' Why, why excuses? Why, good night. You seem to think I've been doing something stupid. Goodness gracious. The Marquis made no reply, but made a sign to the servants who were moving about the parlor. The outer door was opened and a voice was heard calling in the hall. Monsieur Lambert's carriage. Astonished, confused, half out of his mind, the poor notary went out, bowing, and soon found himself in his carriage, without knowing why or how. He rubbed his forehead, tore his hair, and pinched his arm to wake himself up, thinking it likely that he had been the victim of a bad dream. But no, he was not sleeping. He looked at his watch, read the names of the streets by the lamps, and recognized the shops. What had he said? What had he done? What propriety had he offended? What awkwardness, what folly had brought such treatment upon him? For there was certainly no room for doubt. He had been put out of Monsieur de Virmorin's door. And the marriage contract was there in his hand, the contract gotten up with so much care in such good style, and which nobody had heard read. He was in the courtyard of his own house before finding any solution to the problem. The appearance of his concierge inspired him with a brilliant idea. Shinge, he cried. The little emaciated Singe ran up. Shinge, a hundred francs for you if you sincerely tell me the truth, and a hundred kicks if you conceal anything. Singe looked at him with surprise and smiled timidly. You scoundrel, you reckless rascal, why are you smiling? Answer me at once. My God. God, monsieur, said the poor devil, if you'll permit me, monsieur, must excuse me, but monsieur imitates Romagné's accent so well. Romagné's accent? I? I speak like Romagné, like an Aubagne. Monsieur understands it exactly. It has been just so for a week. It can't be. Goodness gracious, I didn't know it. Sengay raised his eyes to heaven and thought his master had gone crazy. 
Monsieur Lambert, aside from this cursed accent, was in full possession of all his faculties. He questioned his people one after the other and was satisfied with regard to his misfortune. Ah, that rascally water carrier, he cried. I'm sure he has been up to some nonsense. Let someone find him. No, never mind. I'll go seek him myself. He hurried off on foot to his pensioner, climbed the five pairs of stairs, rapped without waking him, got angry in a despair, kicked the door in. Monsieur Lambert, cried Romagny. You rascal of an abundia, responded the notary. Gracious goodness! Goodness gracious! The two seemed to be doing their best to tear the language to pieces. Their discussion lasted a good quarter of an hour in the purest Auvergnese, without clearing up the mystery. The one complained bitterly as a victim, and the other defended himself eloquently as an innocent man. "'You stop here for me,' said Monsieur Lambert at length. "'Monsieur Bernier, the doctor, will tell me this very night what stuff you have been up to.' He woke Monsieur Bernier and told him, in the style which you have already been made acquainted with, how he had spent his evening. The doctor gave a laugh and said, <laughs> "'Here's a good deal of fuss over a trifle. Romagné is innocent. You have nobody to blame but yourself. There you stood, with your head bare, going out of the theatre. All the trouble comes from that. You've got a cold in your head. Therefore you speak through your nose. Therefore you speak like an Auvergnat. That's logic. Go home, inhale a little aconite, keep your feet warm and your head cool, take the usual precautions against influenza, for now you know how much depends on your nose. The unfortunate man returned to his hotel, cursing like a good fellow. Shao, said he aloud, my precautions are useless. I have been careful in lodging, feeding, and watching this rascally water carrier, and he's always playing me tricks, and I shall always be his victim without being able to accuse him of anything. Then why should I spend so much money? Bless me, so much the better. I save his pension. No sooner said than done. The next day, Romagné, still half frightened out of his wits, came to get his weekly stipend. Sanguet met him at the door and told him that there was nothing more there for him. He philosophically shrugged his shoulders like a man who, without having read the epistles of Horace, instinctively practiced the nil admirari. Sanguet, who wished him well, asked him what he was going to do. He answered that he was going to look for work. It was just as well, for this forced indolence had borne very heavily on him for a long time. Monsieur Lambert cured his influenza and congratulated himself upon having wiped out from his accounts the item Romagné. No further accident came to interrupt the course of his happiness. He made peace with the Marquis de Villemorin and with all his patrons in the Faubourg, whom he had scandalized a little. Thus delivered from all care, he could unrestrainedly give himself up to the sweet inclination which drew him toward the dowry of Mademoiselle Steinbourg. Happy Lambert! He poured forth his heart and displayed the chaste and eminently proper sentiments with which it was filled. The beautiful and discreet girl gave him her hand in the English fashion and said, Done. My parents agree with me. I'll give you my instructions for the wedding presents. Let's hurry up and get through the formalities so we can go to Italy before the end of the winter. Love lent him wings. He bought the wedding presents without any haggling, delivered over the apartment of Madame to the upholsterers, ordered a new carriage, chose two chestnut horses of the rarest beauty, and hurried the publication of the bands. The parting dinner which he gave to his friends is inscribed among the records of the Café Anglais. His mistresses received his farewells and his bracelets with restrained emotion. The cards of invitation announced that the ceremony would take place at the church of Saint Thomas d'Aquin on the 3rd of March, at one o'clock precisely. It is unnecessary to say that the high altar had been engaged and all the mise en scène of first-class marriages. On the 3rd of March, at eight o'clock in the morning, Monsieur Lambert woke up without being called, smiled at the first rays of a beautiful day, took his handkerchief from under his pillow and carried it to his nose so as to clear up his ideas. But his nose was no longer there. And the cambric handkerchief covered nothing but an empty void. 
With a bound, the notary was before the mirror. Horror and malediction, as they say in romances of the old school. He saw himself as badly disfigured as he was when he returned from Parthenay. To run to his bed and pull over sheets and coverings, look between the bed and the wall, explore the mattress and paliaster, shake the furniture standing near, and turn over the whole room topsy-turvy took him but two minutes. Nothing, nothing, nothing. He hung on to the bell pole, called his servants to the rescue, and swore that he would drive them off like so many dogs if his nose were not found. Fruitless menace! The nose was as hard to find as the Chamber of Deputies in 1816. Two hours were passed in agitation, disorder, and noise. Meanwhile, Steinburg the Elder put on his blue coat with gold buttons, Madame Steinburg, in festive array, superintended two chambermaids and three hairdressers, going, coming, and marching around the beautiful Irma. The pale bride, covered with rice powder like a doughnut before frying, tapped her foot with impatience and scolded everybody with admirable impartiality. The mayor of the 10th arrondissement, gotten up in his red scarf, walked up and down a great empty salon, preparing a little impromptu speech, the privileged mendicants of the Church of Saint-Thomas d'Aquin gave chase to two or three intruders who had come from no one knows where to dispute with them the handsome alms they expected. And Monsieur Henri Steinbourg, who had been for half an hour chewing a cigar in his father's smoking-room, was astonished that his dear Alfred had not yet made his appearance. At last he lost patience, ran to the Rue de Sartine, and found his future brother-in-law in despair and tears. What could he say to console him under such a misfortune? He walked around him a long time, simply repeating the word, Sacré bleu! He made him relate the fatal circumstance a second time, and interlarded the conversation with several philosophic sentences. And that pretty thoroughly cursed doctor, who did not come, he had been sent for post-haste, they had sought him at his house, at the hospital, everywhere. He had arrived after a while and understood at the first glance that Romagné was dead. "'I don't doubt it,' said the notary, with a fresh accession of tears. "'That rascally brute of a Romagné!' Which was the funeral sermon of the unlucky Avignard. "'And now, doctor, what are we to do?' We can get a new Romagné, and you can begin the experiment over again, but you have experienced the inconveniences of this system, and if you take my advice, you will go back to the Indian method. Skin from my forehead? Never! I'd rather have a silver nose. They make very elegant ones now, said the doctor. But still the question is whether Mademoiselle Irma Steinburg would consent to marry a man with a silver nose. Henri, my dear old fellow— "'What do you think about it?' Henri Steinbourg hung his head and made no reply. He went to tell the news to his family and to take Mademoiselle Irma's orders. That amiable lady had an access of heroism when she learned the misfortune of her betrothed. "'Do you think, then,' she cried, "'that I marry him for his looks? "'If that were the case, I should have taken my cousin Rodrigue, "'the clerk in the foreign office.' Rodrigue was not so rich, but a good deal handsomer than he. I have given my hand to Monsieur Lambert because he is an elegant gentleman of admirable social position, because his character, his horses, his disposition, his tailor, in fact, everything about him, delights and enchants me. Moreover, I'm ready dressed, and an interruption to this marriage would injure my reputation. Let's hasten to him, mother. I'll take him as he is. But when she was in the presence of the mutilated man, this fine enthusiasm did not hold out. She fainted. She was brought to, but only to burst into tears. Amid her sobs was heard a cry which seemed to burst from her very soul. Oh, Rodrigue, I've been very unjust to you. Monsieur Lambert remained a bachelor. He had himself a nose made of enameled silver and transferred his practice to his head clerk. A modest little house was for sale near the Invalide. He bought it. A few friends, good livers, brightened up his retreat. He got together a choice wine cellar and consoled himself as well as he could. The finest bottles of Chateau Iquain, the best years of Clos Vouguet, were his. He sometimes said jokingly, 
I've the advantage of other men. I can drink all I want without giving myself a red nose. He remains faithful to his political convictions, reads good papers, and prays for the success of the Count de Chambord. But he does not send him any money. The pleasure of handling his gold brings him a sweet intoxication. He passes his life between two wines and two millions. One evening last week, as he was sauntering leisurely, cane in hand, along the Rue Eble, he uttered a cry of surprise. Romagné's ghost, dressed in blue velveteen, rose before him. Was it really a ghost? Ghosts do not carry anything, and this one was carrying a trunk with a shoulder strap. Romagné, cried the notary. The other raised his eyes and answered in a heavy and tranquil voice, Good evening, Monsieur Lambert. You speak. You're alive, then. Certainly I'm alive. You wretch, what have you done with my nose? As he spoke, he seized him by the collar and shook him. The Auvergnat disengaged himself with some difficulty and replied, Stop! Leave me alone. I can't take up for myself. Bless me, you see, I only have one arm. When you stopped my money, I found a place at a machinist's and got my arm smashed between some wheels. End of chapter 6 End of the Notary's Nose by Edmund Abu Translated by Henry Holt